Thanks for having us. Sure. Keep it up. Hi. Right. Amy. McRaven Trio. salute to Charlie Christian and the Charlie Christian International Music Festival that we'll be uh, allowing you to hear more about here shortly. Thank you guys for coming in and drawing attention to some great music. <laughs> we will get started this morning with our invocation. Pastor Danny Cavett is here. He represents Children's Hospital. He'll lead us in the invocation. Afterwards, I'll ask Councilman John Pettit to leave us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I've also asked uh, uh, Pastor Cavett to lead us in a moment of silence to, uh, to reflect on the moments that happened in Oklahoma City uh, eight days ago. Uh, if everyone would please stand. Stand, please. Let's uh, start with a moment of silence, and then I will end. Thank you. <clears throat> Our Father God, we, we pause and we just uh, are taken back. But Lord, we come to you because you are our, our, our creator God, a God who cares. Even though we look at you and we see all the vastness and all the greatness that you've created, but then sometimes we're taken back even by some of the tragedy. So Lord, we lift this with heavy hearts up to you. So as creator God, Lord, we know that you're in control of everything, so we lift our hearts to you. Not only as creator, but we know that you're God of compassion. And with that, Lord, we've seen so many people just come out and help and give themselves. And Lord, out of this tragedy has come many things of help, of helpfulness, compassion, and Lord, just a togetherness that other people are looking at. We thank you for that, and we thank you for these people that have done that. We know you're also a God of healing in the fact that you can take all these things. And through it, Lord, we can actually be stronger. Just as physically, 
We know that sometimes a, a sickness can actually make us a better person. And so, Lord, we pray that through all of this, that we'll become even stronger. And, Lord, with all this, we know that you're also a God of wisdom. And so, Lord, give a, the city and all the cities that are involved and, and the governments that are involved, Lord, the wisdom to rebuild and to do the right thing. And with that, Lord, with wisdom, I pray for wisdom on this council and everyone here, that, Lord, you would just direct their thoughts and guide them this day. And this is my prayer. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I thought we would begin today's gathering with uh, some reflection on what the city went through on, uh, on May 20th, and I think we probably ought to start with a, um, to express our gratitude from our citizens themselves who through the years have invested hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, in public safety in the, in the, the capital needs, um, uh, the, the salaries of our individual police officers and firefighters and other city staff that were, that were called into immediate action. Um, and, uh, and the training uh, that they've gotten. I was uh, visiting the site of uh, one of the demolished grade schools and I, I by chance got to visit with our police officer who was first on the scene. And you can imagine the chaos and the children and the teachers and administrators that were still buried. And he explained to me that he had been specifically trained in structural collapse. Uh, just one of the many training procedures that, that uh, some of our police officers get the opportunity to go through. And, as a lot of those uh, procedural um, votes come through here and a lot of the dollars that leave uh, this horseshoe going out to spend, I thought, Jeff, what a wise investment that was. And he explained to me that he knew what to do because of that training that, that he had uh, gone through. And ultimately, he was able to free people that he seemed to imply he might not have known exactly how to, to free them otherwise. And I thought that a good example of, um, of, of this community's preparedness for the event that we all hoped uh, would not come. Um, Jim, I, I thought uh, uh, the, the city's uh, response from a public safety standpoint was extraordinary. I, 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 do wanna, I do think it's a good time for us to review it, and I'll get more into that in, in a few minutes, but in, um, in you know, kind of watching it take place and then uh, uh, listening to the media reports and then talking to the police officers and the firefighters down on the scene, um, I, I thought the, the, the quickness in, in which we responded, both from a public work standpoint and police officer and fire, and, and um, I, I know the, the citizens that were affected are extremely grateful, even though they don't necessarily know whom to thank. Um, and, and I don't know that I do either, but um, we have um, so many resources invested in this community, and I tend to think there's probably never been a day in our city's history where we've expelled more of them on one day than that particular day. Um, the, um, the impact to Oklahoma City was significant. Uh, some of the F5 damage did occur in the Oklahoma City city limits. And in the wake of, of the tragedy, um, uh, the deaths, uh, the immense destruction, I thought it would be a good and appropriate time for us to kind of review a lot of the community conversation and community issues um, that people are starting to bring forth. Uh, you know, how was our response from police and fire and EMSA? Um, how, are, how well are we protecting our children who are attending school? Um, I did a little bit of research because um, uh, the question has been haunting me ever since about uh, preparedness in the school and, and how the kids are trained. And in, in trying to do some uh, research uh, through the newspaper's archives and, and talking to some people who might have a better idea than me, I can't find an instance where an Oklahoma City school has been hit by a tornado during daytime hours when kids were in there. Hard to believe it's never happened, and I'm not suggesting it hasn't, but I couldn't find one in, you know, in searching the newspaper's archives for over 100 years. This was an extraordinary event by, by its size, its velocity, and the fact that it was fairly slow moving, so there was a little bit more churn than, than usually you might expect. But the fact that it was in daytime hours, you know, makes it more peculiar than, than anything I can remember. Um, 
in the wake of all the conversations that, that I feel like we ought to have, I have uh, uh, started making some phone calls to put together a task force. And I have asked Councilman White and Councilman Greenwell to serve on it with me. Um, uh, their wards were the two that were most affected by, by last uh, Monday's events. And we still have room for another council person without getting into a quorum issue. So if someone else is interested, they can uh, contact Debbie and, and uh, we'll kind of sort through that aspect of it. But I'll also be bringing in uh, school leaders and some other community leaders, construction leaders, and just to allow us to sort through our response and where we go from here and whatever changes that might need to be made in our building codes or advice um, that, that we give uh, to the school districts um, and our planning department as, as we look forward. Um, and with that, I'll allow other council people to uh, kind of give their other first-hand accounts. Yeah, Pat. You know, I'd like to ask a question. This group you're putting together, which I think is a great idea, will they consider individual form shelters? I had one letter from a constituent who suggested that it would be mandatory in our building code that new construction would have a, some kind of a, of a storm shelter attached to it. Yeah, yes, it will consider those yeah. types of things. It, you know, the safe room, the, 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 uh, the underground shelters, what's appropriate advice, what should be uh, you know, dictated by... There's some people by, don't, by don't like one or the other, and so it's, we, we'd have to be careful how, how we phrase that. Yeah. Because I know uh, I talked to some constituents who had the underground shelters and were concerned after seeing some of the pictures and more, people be in them 22 hours, and then that one that got a lot of concern was the natural gas fire. And uh, the comments said, well, if you were in, the, in your shelter under a pile of r rubble, and the fire started why it would be a, a could be a fatal occurrence mm -hmm. right there so anyway th but there are some concern individual concerns about the types of shelters we might suggest to have in building no that should definitely be part of the conversation thank you Your Honor. yeah meg may i also you know one of the things that we see time after time in this community is the outpouring of generosity and the volunteers flooding in and the, the donations um i hope we might be able to take an opportunity to reflect a little bit about how we stage all that and prepare it and um maybe just take a fresh look at coordination. Um, I think it's been outstanding. I'm not suggesting it's not, but every time I think we have an opportunity to probably improve a little bit on how we get those donated goods out to the public as quickly as possible. So maybe a United Way, Red Cross, kind of a high level look at this would be a good idea as well. Okay, David. <clears throat> uh, Mayor, I, I was able to get down there by around four o'clock that afternoon and uh, it, it just astonishes me how quickly everybody knew what they should be doing from uh, the emergency responders perspective, whether it was fire, police, even our public works, IMSA, uh, Frank Barnes and his uh, emergency response group. They all just immediately uh, converged on the area and began uh, doing the best that they could Granted, the first hour or so, it's a little bit, it may appear to be a little bit uncoordinated, but certainly everybody was doing what they felt like was most appropriate at that time. And then as the evening went on, it became more organized and much better uh, uh, assistance being provided and a much more coordinated event. And I'm, I'm going to stop right there and not begin to name names of individuals that I saw just really going beyond what I had ever expected in their efforts to help. But again, we, we've got an urban search and rescue team. Uh, I knew I said I wasn't going to do this. Headed up by uh, Chief Cecil Clay, did an excellent job going in. You know, I'm trying to identify survivors, trying to identify uh, broken gas lines, down electrical lines, uh, and get those identified and just doing all the things that put them at, uh, you know, very high risk, as well as other uh, firefighters, police officers. You know, the story about the police officer assisting the teacher who had her leg impaled uh, in a table was just very touching uh, and getting that uh, removed. So, you know, again, it's, it's unfortunate I had to go through this to gain the level of understanding as to what uh, our city is capable of, of doing, but it was certainly very reassuring to see that firsthand. 
and how well coordinated public works was working with fire and police and the other divisions were just working so well together uh, it was very uh, very reassuring from my perspective as well as individuals i was at 134th and western uh, about that time and you just saw an outpouring of individuals coming to the scene uh, contractors you know if they had some heavy equipment whether it's a backhoe or something trying to reach the area but individual contractors with just hard hats and gloves coming down trying to help and then a lot of medical uh, personnel doctors nurses other technicians just coming down in t-shirts and jeans or in their scrubs converging on the area very quickly and uh, all in an effort to help so that was uh, again very reassuring thank you yeah, Pete. I'd like to just reiterate what David said um, and add to that that the, the coordination appeared to me to be better uh, vertically than I'd seen it before I mean I understand FEMA was on the scene within an hour um, those are the kinds of things that have, um, have not occurred in the past. Um, the, 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 you know, we take a lot of pride in this thing we call the Oklahoma Standard, but when you see uh, the Big 12 baseball tournament, the teams that came to play here in the tournament, they go help too. They're, they're not from Oklahoma. They're from West Virginia or they're from West Texas or wherever, but they were there also helping. The, just the breadth of the whole thing of the response to me was was uh, was really uh, uh, rewarding. I mean, if you can find a uh, a rose in that devastation, it was that the fact that the, the the response, the breadth of the response, not just Oklahoma people, but people all across the country, federal people, the county people, the state people, not just Oklahoma City people, but everybody responded and. Uh, I think we have a lot that says a lot for us, but it says a lot for the human spirit. I think that kids from TCU's baseball team are down there picking up trash, and kids from West Virginia are doing the same thing. I think it says a lot for all of us as a as a as a as a society that uh, that spirit, that standard, really is not just confined to Oklahoma. It's in the hearts of most people, and I, I appreciate so much the breadth of that response. I, I just echo that. I think, you know, for just a, a, at least a brief period, we were all human beings. There was no politics. Everybody came together. It's unfortunate that we were gaining so much experience, but we clearly, the command center on 126th and Penn was put together so fast. Public Works was clearing the streets all night. Fire had their, their searches done in our area, not once, but twice by midnight, which was just stunning. Actually, our, our police or sorry, our fire truck, actually the transmission that morning wasn't working and everybody scrambled to get that thing running and get it to 126th and Penn. And I understand now we're looking at a 48 foot combined fire and police uh, command truck that I think will... We already bought it and it should be beautiful. here in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in route. Beautiful. Almost. Um, I think it's, you know, so a task force is a great idea, probably overdue. Uh, this area has had a, a tornado an average of every two and a half years since 1991. Not all F4 and F5, but three F4 and F5s in 14 years, an average of one every two and a half years. So I think that task force is a great idea. Um, Health Department, I think, uh, did like 600 tetanus shots yesterday. So I would just emphasize that everybody that's out working, uh, people, there's a lot of nails, there's a lot of, make sure that your tetanus shot is within five years if you're out working. And I applaud uh, the health department as well. Thanks. As Pete mentioned, the uh, Big 12 championships uh, were held uh, one day later than usual with a different format, but the crowd on Sunday was extraordinary. And as you mentioned, uh, the, the players and the coaches even got involved on the, uh, on the giving side and, and served in our community. And I bring that up because we have a number of events coming to Oklahoma City right here in the wake of this, of this tragedy. Uh, this week, the uh, Softball World Series will be taking place. And so you're going to have um, the top uh, amateur softball players in the country coming in representing their respective colleges. And we want to put on our, 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 our best show there. But again, um, I, I think every event, at least uh, for the short term, uh, is going to be respectful of, of what our community is still going through and uh, will continue to go through through the rebuilding process. 
One of the events that we look for annually that uh, we know will provide a lot of joy in Oklahoma City is the Charlie Christian International Music Festival. And we have a proclamation. I'll ask Anita to come forward. Is Mark Temple with you, Anita? Yeah, come on up, Mark. We have a proclamation for the Charlie Christian International Music Festival. I'll ask the clerk to read it as we get settled. Whereas the Black Liberated Arts Center, now in its 43rd year, was organized to showcase the cultures of African Americans and has brought to our city and state the best in fine arts and arts education experiences to help develop the artistic talents and teaching abilities of Oklahomans. Whereas the Black Liberated Arts Center has produced the annual Charlie Christian International Music Festival in Oklahoma City for the education and enrichment of all people for 28 years. Whereas the Black Liberated Arts Center recognizes the contributions of many Oklahoma musicians to the field of music through the Charlie Christian International Music Festival to be held June 4th through June 9th, 2013. Whereas the Black Liberated Arts Center will present a special program, Ralph Ellison Understood, through Charlie Christian at the Oklahoma History Center in recognition of the friendship, respect, and comradeship of Charlie Christian and Ralph Ellison during the 100th anniversary of Ralph Ellison and the 28th Charlie Christian International Music Festival. Whereas the Black Liberated Arts Center has brought immeasurable recognition to Oklahoma City through the Charlie Christian International Music Festival and has established the festival as an international attraction for Oklahoma City as a sponsoring organization of the event and recipient of the Jazz at Lincoln Center's Hall of Fame Award for Charlie Christian. Now, therefore, Mick Cornett, the mayor of the city of Oklahoma City, does hereby proclaim June 4th and June 9th as Charlie Christian International Music Festival Week in Oklahoma City, and he encourages all citizens to take this opportunity to experience the musical artistry of the festival. Let's show our appreciation to the organizers behind this wonderful event. Um, Anita, help me with the math. June 4th is the day it begins. Is that a week from today? It is correct. So on Tuesday? All right. Yes. What else do we need to know? Well, instead of the 9th, we um, have shortened it to June 8th. But we have uh, a very historic uh, event coming up. Um, we are collaborating with the Ellison Centennial Commission, uh, headed up by Robert Henry out at OCU, uh, celebrating his anniversary as well. And at the same time, we are launching a musical campaign a journey to Charlie Christian's Centennial um, event coming up in 2016. It will be held at the Bricktown Ballpark uh, on the 7th and 8th, the outdoor festival part. will be at the ballpark, which was the original site of the first Frederick A. Douglas High School established in 1896. So that's another important aspect, historically speaking, of the festival this year. We have some traditional uh, events during the festival that we've carried forth ever since day one, the jam session. The uh, Battle of the Bands will be held down in Bricktown. That's a free event to the public, and it will be on the lower uh, Bricktown Plaza, uh, right in front of the fountain near Sonic. And we will have two of Oklahoma City's best bands dueling musically the 411 band, and Short Dog. Some of you may have heard of uh, those two bands, but they are excellent. All of the music is excellent, and we so appreciate the musicians of Oklahoma City uh, from Deep Deuce uh, back in the day all the way up to right now. We appreciate the music history uh, here in Oklahoma City, and we appreciate the city and um, all of your support in sponsoring, co-sponsoring this event over the 28 years. So um, we'd also like for you to know that uh, in light of the tragedy uh, and more, that so many musicians and people around the world, around the world, have sent emails wondering how we were doing, are you okay? And wanting me to express to you their heartfelt sympathy and condolences and their pain.
for what Oklahoma Citians are going through right now with the more tragedy. So, you know, our reach is far and the hearts are everywhere uh, feeling the pain that we feel here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, and we will certainly enjoy your week next week. Let's show our appreciation one more time for Anita and Mark. Thank you, guys. As the meeting is officially called to order, I'll ask for a motion on item 3A, B, and C. This is a series of appointments. Second. All right. Comments or questions on the appointments? Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 4 is the Journal of Council Proceedings. Item 4A is to receive the Journal of Council Proceedings for May 14th. And item 4B is to approve the Journal of Council Proceedings for April 30th and May 7th. Comments or questions on the journal? Is there a second? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And item five is request for uncontested continuances. Mayor, on page 26, under item 8G1, 8G1, page 26, item D, 1715 North Young's Boulevard, we ask that be stricken, the owner has removed. And item M337 Southeast 42nd, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has removed. Moving to page 27, under item 8H1, item B, 3036 cash in place, we ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured item C, 3101, 3201 South Goff Avenue. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured item D, 3816 West Liberty. We ask that that be stricken. That's now occupied. Item G, 2819 West Reno. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured item J, 5113 South Villa. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. And item Z, 337. Southeast 42nd Street, we ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. And then moving to page 30, under claims for denial, under item 8QA, uh, the claim of Robert Boone, we ask that, that that be deferred two weeks until June 11th. And also under 8Q, item D, uh, the claim of Northwest Optimus, and we ask that that one also be deferred until June 11th. Any other requests for uncontested continuances? All right, let's recess the council meeting convened as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. All right, comments or questions on the MFA? Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. We'll adjourn the OC MFA convened as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. Six items on the PPA. Comments or questions here? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCPPA, convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust. Two items. Yes. Comments or questions on the EAT? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCEAT and reconvene the council meeting with a consent docket. All right, we have a motion and a second on the consent docket. Are there any individual considerations? Your Honor, I have a question on 6A1. AT and BF. And Mr. Mayor, uh, 6AB, 6AJ1, and 6BB. And I guess I'll go ahead, Mayor, and mention BE and BG1 and 2. All right, Pat, you want to get us started with item A1? Uh, thank you, Ron. I just was curious if this we had a completion date on this project yet. Uh, this extends at 92 days, which is mm. I think, a long time, given the, the length of time they've been out there working. And it's attributed to some um, 
delays outside the contractor's control? And uh, whose responsibility would it have been to uh, deal with those delays? Which item is this, Pat? Uh, AI. A oh, AI. AI. Okay. Sorry. That's all right. Mr. Weiner, on item I AI, can you help us out on the reason for the, the delays and the extent of those delays? It's the uh, project up on Northwest 164th and Penn. It's been a, a, a matter of great discussion by the people out there as to why it's taken so long to get it done. Yeah, I believe, generally speaking, that we still struggle with some utility relocations that were just a part of the intersection improvements. My understanding is those have been reconciled, but I can get a better time frame and a timeline for you. Will they take 92 days, additional days? There was 92 days of delay that the contractor experienced, so he's 92 days behind what he would originally been provided. So this is granting him time that he was not able to work. We need to do everything we can to expedite that project at this point because it's been torn up uh, for quite a period of time right now. And the people out there keep asking when it's going to be finished. Completely agree. And let me get you a timeline on that and get you projected. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah I think that brings up a, a problem we typically see. You know, uh, utilities companies don't seem to respond as quickly as we would like them to. And the citizens generally uh, want to put the finger at somebody. And, you know, we're the, we're the ones usually uh, holding that, uh, that vulnerability bag. Um, but you bring up a good point, and if there's, you know, if there's any way we could figure out a way to, to get the utility companies to respond, you know, more quickly, I, I know the citizens would appreciate it, and I know uh, certainly the, the nine of us would as well. That's kind of a continual conversation that we have. Well, can that be discussed when we have our, uh, you know, our contracts with our utility companies? I know we don't do that very often because those, those are long-term. Franchise agreements. Franchise agreements. Yeah. Um, we're actually covered in there whether we can get them to execute that the language isn't bad in the franchise agreements uh, except for AT&T and they were here before statehood so they, there, there's our uh, we have a little weaker language with AT&T but we generally have pretty good language but for example and I'm not picking on OG&E but but on a situation that they've had they, they sometimes are heavily impacted by by storm removal and they, they, they will get pulled off for uh, weather events that, that do impact it so. Okay. One of the things that might improve that, and this goes back to some experience I had years and years ago, is to identify the utilities early on in the process before we let the contract even. Uh, and so we, we don't run into contract delays. Uh, I mean, if I may comment, we actually are looking and coordinating with utilities almost two years in advance of the relocations. And I think one of the things that we find is as we schedule work and their schedule coincidental work, it's just a matter of getting into their time frame for all of the work that's underway in Oklahoma City as well. I think what you'll find as part of a budget presentation that I'll make for Public Works in about a week is a utility coordinator position that we hope that will help alleviate some of the concerns. One of the things that's happening is Utility companies, as they receive requests from the city or other cities, aren't able to prioritize what's a more important project over a lesser important project. So the utility coordinator, at least on behalf of the city, would be able to help prioritize those projects like this one to get it to the top of the list versus, say, a less sensitive project that could move down, perhaps. So uh, we are looking at opportunities to better that here in the coming year. Thank you. Uh -huh. Ed, uh, AT. AT, I mentioned just because tangentially, at least, it's going to be related to what Meg is bringing up under items from council. And I think it goes to why it's a good idea to extrapolate what we can spend if we go into the fund balance outside of resurfacing. A couple years ago, remember, it was the policy that we wanted to strictly restrict it to resurfacing streets. And I think this is a good example of, um, while this was Public Works recommendation to resurface May Avenue, uh, we ended up having a shortfall on Western, and so we diverted that fund balance money over to Western, and then applied through ACOG for a federal surface transportation grant and ended up getting the money uh, through that. We've also had uh, circumstances where we've got money from the county, joint projects, or developers have been willing to go 50-50 on resurfacing. So I think, I think it's just a good illustration of why we should go, we should not limit fund balance strictly to resurfacing because there's other funds available. Um, in terms of BF, I, 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 I argued this point in, in January, so I won't belabor the point. I think that in terms of, I question some of, of what's written in the report about how important local incentives were to bringing these uh, Boeing jobs to Oklahoma City. Uh, I think that um, probably the, the primary reason is that there were efficiencies for the company. 
located next to Tinker Air Force Base, and so there's other reasons. If it was incentives, I think the $26 million in state incentives would probably be enough uh, and, not, and not require local incentives. We don't know where these employees are living. They could be in Edmond, Midwest City, Moore, Norman. So for Oklahoma City to be the only municipality who's paying $4.5 million of taxpayer subsidies, it uh, doesn't seem fair. The other, if we're either, the, and, and that's why, frankly, it seems more appropriate to do it at the state level. Do you have any conversations with the Boeing people? You did a lot of research, obviously, in this project. No. I didn't think. Okay. So, but, but the, the, I think that as we, legally, this, this qualifies. And so I think there's, you, there's no, I mean, you, you've got to vote for it because legally it, it fits the definition of what was voted for in the 2007 bond. I think as we go forward in the next bond, if we're going to do incentives, we should diversify our incentives because all of our incentives are, are, are looking similar. They're going to very large, uh, sometimes multinational corporations for jobs. When the bulk of job creation in the city of Oklahoma City is from existing companies' expansion or startups. And so investing in local small businesses is where you're going to get larger bang for your buck. And I just think that as we go forward, we should diversify our incentives. Thanks. Because the incentives are available Ed, to those small businesses adding employees. That's just, that's not where the bulk of the $75 million is going. Exactly. Well, the bulk of the $75 million is still, we haven't issued those bonds yet. But we have, uh, to the extent we've been asked, we've been able to incentivize some smaller businesses uh, for additional jobs. And so it, it's, it, it's not a, a, we're not ignoring that sector of the community, of the, of the industrial development job creation aspect. We know it's important. And we have, uh, throughout, if you look at the history of that uh, trust, we've done what we can to encourage those sort of small think, businesses. Uh, 75, I mean, if you combine this with the one that we already gave Boeing, almost 10% of the 75 million is going to Boeing. You gave 7 million to Continental. You gave several million to Chesapeake. I think the, the bulk of the funds have been expended so We've far. We've allocated that money. We haven't expended it yet. It's, it's after the fact, and it's uh, based on actual uh, performance. They're actually paying the wages that they've said they were going to pay to the number of people they said they were going to be here. Okay. But we haven't expended that money until we get proof that they've complied with the, the, the terms of the agreement we signed. Great. Thank you. John, item A, B. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this question is to city staff. Does this require further commitment from the city, this particular project? The, the only other commitment is we are uh, supporting the construction of the alley behind this particular housing. So the but city, beyond that, no. Okay, so the city will be responsible for maintaining uh, this particular alley? Um, it will be a, a public alley. All right, thank you. That was my uh, question as it relates to A, B, uh, A, excuse me, 6AJ1. Um, this relates to the parks. Uh, what, is, what improvements will be made uh, in uh, the Lincoln and Perry parks? I think uh, Wendell Wisenhunter, Parks Director, probably more specific, but generally the project is shelters and playgrounds at most of the parks that you see listed here. There's obviously um, five locations, but generally it's, it's playgrounds and, uh, and the shelters, the covered pavilion type improvements. All right. Thank you. Then my next question relates to uh, 6BB. Um, when will the sites be determined? And when would the bid to go out for these uh, particular projects? And this relates to sidewalks. Is this at the airport, John? Uh, 6BB, I believe. Yeah, BB is with the airport trust uh, let in me, the land office. Sorry. Uh, BB. Oh, BV? B. B. B as in Victor. Okay. B as in Victor, I'm sorry. All right. That's a MAPS-3 project, and it's the next phase of sidewalks, and, and generally a sidewalk master plan was approved by the MAPS uh, subcommittee, the MAPS advisory board, and the council uh, a number of, of uh, months ago, and so we'd be following that criteria. Right. This is the phase two of the sidewalks. We're, we're right in the middle of, of the phase one on the agenda. You also have the contract award 
Well, next, next meeting will be the contract award for the first group. We have preliminary report for the second group in the first phase. So this is engineered to start the second phase, and it will be, as, as Mr. Couch said, based on that master plan that was done for the sidewalk locations. And I definitely would love to sit down with staff and talk about the sidewalks, because I do have issues with uh, the report that was done, because it seems Ward 7 got the very short end of the stick when it comes to sidewalks. Thank you. Meg, item BE. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to mention that uh, item BE is a resolution authorizing um, us to make an application to the U.S. Department of Transportation for a Tiger grant. A um, lot of money, $13.5 million. And I think we're aware that very few of those are funded and very few of those are funded to the full extent. But um, you know, it, it is another um, example of how COPTA and um, the city is working with ACOG to try to uh, put together enhanced funding packages for our intermodal transit hub that we hope to see well underway in the future. Um, item um, BG uh, 1 and 2, I just also wanted to mention that you know, when we created um, TIF 8 related to the construction of the Devon Tower, there was a portion of those funds that went to Oklahoma County. And so uh, B1 and B2 are two projects. Um, one is the Oklahoma County Annex Building Renovation uh, at 315 Park Avenue. And the second is um, the parking garage renovation, also at 321, um, both which will be receiving allocations from the county's portion of the TIF-8 dollars. All right. Any other comments or questions on the consent docket? All right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. On to the concurrence docket, four items. Move the items. All right, are there any individual considerations? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8A begins a series of items that require a separate vote by the City Council. Item 8A1 is in Ward 7. It's a zoning case at 1535 Southeast 25th Street. It's an I-1 light industrial district. It would become an I-2 moderate industrial district. John, you okay with this? Yes. I move for approval. Second. All right, any comments or questions from the audience on item 8A1? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 8A2 is a zoning case in Ward 3 at 11701 Southwest 59th Street. It's currently a planned unit development, and it would be uh, changed to an R1 single-family residential district, Larry. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Is any, <clears throat> excuse me, has anybody signed up to protest? Uh, this is a development that was approved by the, uh, by the Planning Commission. Uh, unless the Council has any questions, I move for approval. All right. Cast your votes on item 8A2. Passed unanimously. Item 8A3 is a zoning case in Ward 6. The address is 1401 Southwestern Avenue. It's currently an I-2 moderate industrial, R-1 single-family residential, and a scenic river overlay design district, and it would become a new PUD. Meg? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Tim Johnson is here, I believe, on behalf of the applicant, and I think I see the applicant here as well. Hello, Mayor. Tim, maybe you could, this was introduced the other day, but maybe you could share a little bit about the uh, project at the downtown air park. Thank you so much. Uh, Tim Johnson with Johnson Associates on behalf of the applicant as well as the property owner, Mr. Humphreys, who's here as well. Uh, this is a uh, kind of a unique uh, application. It's a PUD that has a sunset clause in it. Uh, it's a PUD that will be enacted for uh, three years. It's to allow for a temporary uh, outdoor event venue. There'll be a stage constructed and it'll be outdoor concerts. Uh, they're limited to I believe it's 12 a year, uh, and their season typically runs from May, June to October. Um, the the uh, applicant's uh, desire is to uh, you know, uh, create a new entertainment area uh, along the river. Uh, we've worked very closely with the planning staff as well as the Scenic River Overlay District. We've received approvals by both Planning Commission and the district. Uh, worked, uh, walked through the neighborhood. We do not have any protesters. Uh, the, the, we had a lot of support from the neighborhood. Great. Well, Tim, I really appreciate that. I was hoping you were going to mention that because I know that staff had some concerns when they put the report together originally about the close proximity to the neighborhoods. Right. 
and I have had a chance to visit with staff as well. And we have had concerts down in this location in the past, particularly Fourth of July events um, that have been well received by the neighborhood. Um, I think it's also important to point out that this is temporary in more than one aspect. The PUD does sunset, as you said, but it also, um, on an annual basis, on an annual basis, requires the joint um, renewal, both from the property owner and the operator. That's correct. So, um, should either one of those parties not wish to go forward, um, it would not. Um, and I, you know, I think it's a great opportunity to see something beginning to happen down here on the river. The project's been property's been vacant for a long time, and the project um, that were discussed, um, you know, are looking for a catalyst to move forward. So, um, I would uh, move the uh, recommendation forward. All right, we have a motion then on item 8A3. Is there a second? Cast your votes. One. Yeah. yeah, Larry. I'd just like to make a, a, a oh, brief sure. comment, Tim, if I could, and Meg. I'm going to vote for this, but I do have some reservations over this. This is not the red, white, and boom type of concert that the Philharmonic used to put on down there. And uh, I do have some questions about it, uh, and I hope I'm wrong on this. But uh, the one-year renewal, I think, needs to be kept in mind should this uh, particular venue not produce the quality of uh, concerts that we're anticipating. Larry, if I could respond to that, and I do want to make it very clear, both in my conversations with Tim and with uh, the property owner, I, I, if we have complaints from the neighborhood, it will be a subject that will have to be revisited. Yeah, David. Uh, could I just ask a question as far as plans or requirements to uh, minimize the risk with respect to, uh, say, a grass fire or any type of safety issue that may occur during the uh, concerts? What kind of plans we have in place? Uh, we have worked very closely with the uh, police department. As you know, they have a lease on the heliport in the area, and we have agreed to provide off-duty police officers for security as well as traffic control. Uh, that specific agreement it also includes the ability to have radio frequencies that will communicate with both police and fire. I think there's also a requirement that we added two different means of egress. That's correct, into the and that's in the plan. Right, and excuse me for not knowing more about this plan, but there still is a lot of uh, grassy area, isn't there? And as we get further into the summer, you know how it gets dry. and if smoking is allowed or somebody brings some type of, uh, you know, cooking material, the risk of, of a grass fire is all I'm raising. I understand. There point. will be uh, concessions here uh, that are controlled by the operator. Uh, the, the area south of the, the bold line on your uh, image in front of you is the old runway, and that will be used as your emergency ingress and egress. Um, and the second uh, point of ingress and egress will be south of the main entry that's there now. So um, the runway areas will be uh, cordoned off. They won't be allowed to park anywhere except for in the venue area. Mr. May, a quick question as it relates to parking. Um, uh, will there be signs on the residential streets that says no parking? Uh, doing uh, event uh, operations? There is no access through the neighborhood uh, to the venue. It'll be, it's fenced off or will be fenced off. Uh, if that becomes an issue, the, the applicant would be happy to apply to the traffic commission to, to have signage put up. I, I believe signs needs to be uh, placed uh, off of previous experience. Uh, I stay uh, right down the street from the zoo amphitheater. Uh, so uh, I know all too well what happens when concerts uh, occur. You have people who will park uh, down the street, so they will not have to pay uh, for um, parking. So I definitely believe the applicant uh, needs to go to the Traffic Commission and request those signs. We'll make that commitment. How, how would this, would it, would it cause any impact on the, the heli police helicopters? I guess I'd ask the uh, chief to address that. Okay. Tim, while chief's coming forward, you have had a series of meetings, I yes, think, with the police. Yes, several meetings with the operator uh, and the commander in the field, uh, on the site, several phone conversations. It's been a good 
productive process. Great. Uh, Tim, I ask a question. Uh, how would this particular project fit in with the overall plan for this area? It was touted very highly initially as a, as a redevelopment area with uh, housing offices and a whole bunch right. of things. And that plan is still uh, on the table, obviously, with the economy taking a dive in the 08, 09 era. The, uh, this is an interim use. That's why we put a sunset clause in it. Okay. So this, this facility essentially be wiped off and they get ready to do Correct. the redevelopment. Thank you. Pat, I thought that was an interesting use of this. At the end of the three years, uh, it reverts back to its original zoning. Chief, the question was about the, the potential impact of the events uh, scheduled to be held on this site as they might occur to the uh, helicopter use of uh, the police department. Yeah, I think, I mean, we've met with them and they've, they've kind of agreed on a cordoned, cordoned off area around that helicopter site. The, uh, the only issues that I had concerns about was the actual location of the staging so close to the, to the helicopter area. Uh, I mean, my preference would have been to have the actual uh, staging area further to the south on that property versus right up next to that helicopter site. But uh, I'm sure that w we can make it work either way. It would probably work better if it was a little bit further south and not right. I know you want to have it on the river. I think the idea was to have it right on the river. So, uh, but that's also right next to the helicopter, and there could be some some impact but we you know we could probably work through those issues okay thanks Chief. thanks we in our meetings with the police uh, staff there is a line that doesn't show up on that drawing that we've established with them that creates a, a north south clear area it's west of that little uh, dash line that goes around the heliport site and the stage itself is located on the airplane turnaround uh, at the north end it is located uh, not in the middle, but towards the south of that turnaround area slightly. Uh, so it's, it's as far away in that tract as we can get from the helipad. All right, ready to vote? We have a motion and a second. Let's vote again. Cast your votes. Pass unanimously. Thank you very much. Huh? We're on to item 8A4. It's a zoning case in Ward 7 at 735 Southeast 15th Street. It's currently R1 single family residential, C3 community commercial, and a scenic river overlay district and it would become a new spud. John? Do we have any protesters for this item? No one has signed up to speak. Is there anyone here wishing to speak against item 8A4? All right, looks like you're ready to go. All right, I move for approval. Thank you. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8A5 is a zoning case in Ward 6 at 1324 Southwest 44th Street. It's currently R1 single family residential and it become a new simplified plan unit development. Meg? Yes, is uh, Sabini here? I didn't know if the applicant was here. I guess perhaps not. Bob, I just wanted to make sure this is actually to permit the use of an existing tax office along uh, Southwest 44th Street where we have a, a number of businesses along there. There are a couple of technical um, requirements that we asked for, particularly moving the parking from the front side and returning the lawn and moving the parking to the back. Yes, he, he's agreed to those. He hasn't submitted the easement that we requested for the side triangle on the corner. Okay, because I did notice that we wanted a 25-foot side triangle in the right of way. Would you prefer, I mean, this is asking for an emergency, but would you prefer to wait until you have the easement? Uh, yes, we, well, we need to, I think he needs to be here and explain if he doesn't want to provide that easement, right. so it should be deferred at least a week, or well, probably two weeks, I guess. Then I would uh, make a motion that we defer this for two weeks so that we can be sure we've got that easement in hand. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second on item 8A5 for a deferral of two weeks. Any comments or questions on that request for a deferral? All right, cast your votes, and that item is deferred two weeks. Item 8A6 is a zoning case in Ward 3. The address is 3115 South May Avenue. It's currently R2, medium, low residential, and it would become a new simplified planning development. Larry, we have one person that has signed up to speak. Okay, is the applicant present? If you would, uh, just share with the council what your plans are for this particular piece of property. Yeah. Yeah. 
which is when I make, he wants to make it into a, like a commercial business. Okay, it's just like a, come on, it's like to sell like ice cream and, you know, just small stuff. It's not going to be real, like food or, you know, nothing like that. This was approved unanimously by the Planning Commission. It's a small piece of property that abuts Woodson Park. Uh, it's on uh, South May. Uh, thank you very much. Let's hear from, uh, is there a protest to this? I don't know, just someone has signed up to speak on it. Um, Annette Richardson? Yes, then me. Oh, that's you? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> that's me. well, you're already here. I'm interpreting right. for him. <laughs> Wish it always worked out that way. <laughs> yeah. This property does share uh, a common boundary with Meg across the street in Ward 6, so if she's okay with it, I'm okay with it, uh, I move for approval. Okay. All right, comments or questions on this item from anyone else? All right, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Good luck with your business. Uh huh. Item 8A7 is also in Ward 3. It's at 505 Oakdale Drive. It's currently R1 single family residential, and it would become a new simplified plan unit development. Larry? Thank you, Your Honor. Is the applicant here? There were, has anybody signed up? Nope. This is a, 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 was unanimously approved by the Planning Commission. Uh, the neighbors originally had some question about it. The, uh, the gentleman, Russell Cox, met with the neighbors. Uh, they wholeheartedly endorsed it. Uh, it's an indoor facility, will be built to raise tilapia. So if you like tilapia, we'll have homegrown indoor tilapia. And the feed for the tilapia will come from a garden on the property, and that garden will also be used to sell fresh vegetables uh, as people come by. So it's a, uh, and the neighbors are very excited uh, in a positive way. Uh, the gentleman, for example, did make his uh, storm shelter available for some of the neighbors during this recent uh, uh, rash of tornadoes, and they were very appreciative of that. So unless the council has some more questions, I move for approval. All right, comments or questions on item 8A7? Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 8A8 is a zoning case in Ward 2 at 1169 Northwest 56th Street. It also takes in 1163 and 1165 Northwest 57. The property is currently our one single family residential and it would become a new spud. Ed, we have one person that signed up to speak. Uh, let's hear from them. Okay. All right, uh, Rob Littlefield. Good morning, Rob Littlefield, 1148 Northwest 56th Street. I'm founder, past president, and current chair, uh, committee chair of Meadowbrook Acres Neighborhood Association. Uh, here to speak in support of this awesome residential project. What I wanted to do today was take a minute to enlighten some, some folks that are new on the council that aren't familiar with the history of Meadowbrook Acres and re remind the folks that have been here during the course of the work in that neighborhood. Um, eight years ago, it was a, a, a neighborhood that had uh, uh, vacant lots and dilapidated structures. It, it had uh, not, not very good shape. And Chesapeake Energy came along and started working the Class and Curve Commercial District on the north and west boundaries of the neighborhood. Uh, the, the neighborhood and Chesapeake worked together to identify a neighborhood and to identify a commercial district. And all along, the question during that process was, what, what happens to the, to the residential properties? It, if, it, it was inevitable that if the neighborhood hadn't gotten organized, the entire neighborhood would have been consumed probably by Chesapeake as a commercial entity. So it happened that we have a commercial district and a residential district, and proof of the pudding is uh, SPUD 500, which happened a couple of years ago, four residential projects by the current applicant today. They were all sold before, before the, they, the dirt was even turned. And uh, here we are today again with another application for I believe six new residential projects in the neighborhood. And it just shows the value of the residential property in Meadowbrook Acres, the value of the residential properties along the Western Avenue corridor. People want to live there. Developers want to develop them. Uh, it, it's, it's just a great thing where 
not every single case where, where an R1 property is being considered more in favor of being upzoned as commercial in this particular part of town. Houses are working. Residential projects are working. So on behalf of the board and the members of Meadowbrook Acres, go for it. Please approve this. It's a, it's a very, very good thing for the community and the neighborhood. Are there any questions to Mr. Littlefield before he gets away? Any comments? Rob, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Move for approval. Second. Thank you very much. That brings us up to item B, uh, PUD 1484 North Missouri Avenue from R1 Single Family Residential District to PUD 1484 Plan Unit Development District in Ward 7. John? Uh, I see that the applicant uh, is present. Uh, can you pre uh, briefly come and uh, explain um, item B? And I know there were some issues as it relates to the overall design uh, of this project, and um, I think the issues have been worked out, but I'm not quite for sure. Uh, Ron Walters, uh, I guess I'm the applicant. <laughs> may, Mr. Walter, may we have your uh, address for the record? Yes, 8501 South Walker. Uh, Mr. Pettis, I think you're right. They have drummed me to death on these issues. Well, good. <laughs> well, good. Actually, this is a project part of the uh, city's strategic neighborhood initiative. Um, we've been building uh, in the neighborhood south of there for several years, and uh, naturally we're growing into the north area. Uh, this area is the uh, part right adjacent to the Truman School, the existing old Truman School site. Uh, our proposal is to go in here and build seven new homes, three of which some of them have, uh, three of which have some city assistance, the rest of them are all market rate properties. Uh, there's another developer and they're here today, I think y'all approved their uh, application a little while ago, that's actually going to be building in there with us. Urban Renewal looks like has gained control of the Truman site. Uh, so this is a very exciting time in, in, uh, in a neighborhood that's maybe a little bit difficult uh, uh, to go back in and try and revitalize one of these areas and bring some new life into, into an existing area. But, Are there any other questions from the council? Uh, I do have one question, and this is to uh, actually staff uh, as it relates, because eventually um, you, are, you are going to receive funding from uh, the city to continue uh, this project. Uh, my question is, will this project uh, uh, require any additional resources from the city? The, you know, Russell probably can address that. Thank you, Russell. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear the question. Okay, the question is, will this particular project, I know eventually um, uh, Ms. Walters has to come back in front of the council, but uh, will this particular project uh, require any additional funding uh, for, from the city or resources uh, from the city? No. All right. Thank you. Uh, do we have any protesters? All right. I, I, I so move. Second. Uh, item C is ordinance on final hearing. Uh, recommended for approval, closing a portion of the Northwest Utility Easement in Block 3, Stonebridge West Edition, uh, in Ward 1. James, you I, I haven't heard any uh, protesters. Anybody signed up? No. No? Okay. Well, is there anybody here who wants to talk about it? Okay, I move for approval. Second. I have a motion made and second to approve item B. Oh, please cast your vote. Item D is the ordinance on final hearing uh, recommended for denial. Uh, this is uh, 1009 Northwest 49th Street from R1 Single Family Residential District to a, a SPUD, uh, and it's in Ward 2. Ed, would you like to? We've got several people signed up wanting to speak on this one. Dennis, do you mind if I just give some history just for a minute? I, Not at all. Uh, this is. Um, for John and James, we, this is something we've dealt with in the past. Um, this neighborhood is, is they're veterans of um, dealing with zoning applications on this corner of 50th and Western. Um, along with my predecessor, Sam Bowman, they held off um, an application from a Walgreens to try and go in there. Um, they had a bank just to the south. And Boyd, can you show that? Um, 
they they got burned a little bit on the on on the bank because when and it has similarities to this. There was negotiation to, to develop a fence and a, a green belt, similar to what we're hearing today. Um, not all of the uses uh, and the infrastructure were spelled out, and so after the fence was made and the green belt was established, this uh, diesel generator was put next to this is somebody's backyard, um, which is it, it's tested for four hours every Friday. The neighbors describe it as a, a semi truck driving through the neighborhood, and so. I think it, it, sh it shows that, that without, it, without understanding the, all the uses and the infrastructure, just having a green belt and fence doesn't necessarily um, uh, minimize impacts. But in June of 2011, if you go to the next slide, in June of 2011, before we knew about anything on this corner, just to the left or just to the west of this house, um, Chesapeake Land Corporation bought a house um, on that empty lot. Um, three months later, in September of 2011, they tore it down. Neighbors said they came in and it tore it down in about 45 minutes. Uh, and nobody knew anything prior to that. About six months later, um, Chesapeake approached the neighbors and said that in all that land there on, on the corner of 50th and Western, they wanted to put a large 20-pump uh, gas station uh, slash retail. Uh, and then just where you can't see it, there on the corner of 49th and Western, there's going to be a, a separate building. Um, they, um, the, unlike the Walgreens, um, the Bishop McGinnis and other corporate entities weren't, didn't come to the table with the neighborhoods as they had before, uh, and so the neighborhood was really on their own. They felt like um, this application was probably inevitable, uh, and so they tried to negotiate some mitigating, they tried to negotiate a street closure to close 49th Street, which is in front of us. Um, they came to the council about a year ago. Um, the, um, it was clear that Russell Klaus had, uh, would not support, uh, nor would I, a uh, closure of 49th Street, and the neighbor was caught, the neighborhood was caught, I think, off guard. I asked for a continuance, a 30-day continuance, to allow the neighborhood in Chesapeake to, to discuss the matter further. That was voted down by the council by a 6-3 vote. So then this, the SPUD was, uh, was approved also by a 6-3 to three vote. Uh, and then things kind of stopped. You know, a lot of um, uh, news ab about Chesapeake, and it, it seemed that things were maybe put on hold. Chesapeake is now selling a considerable amount of property, not just in my ward, but throughout the city. Uh, and so it's unclear what, what exactly use is, what's going to happen to this land. Um, we've been told in private meetings that, that there's a building there on 49th and Western um, that they have a tenant for. Um, they won't, haven't disclosed who the tenant is or what the use will be for that building. So we don't know what exactly is going to go there, but they're saying that now they need additional parking for that. And so they'd like to convert this empty uh, lot here to additional surface parking lot and then a, a green belt between it, itself and that house. Um, you had considerable protests. You had 120 protesters. You had uh, 14 of them were within the 300 feet. The problem with the 300 feet rule in a situation like this is that the city of Oklahoma City owns a large chunk of that. Our fire station is right there. And then the other entity that owns a tremendous amount of land is Chesapeake, is the applicant. So the applicant either owns land or has employees that own, and you combine that plus the city of Oklahoma City, it makes it almost impossible to get to 50%. But certainly the neighborhood's against it, and even with all that, they were at 25% protest. Um, the, this was not included in the SPUD, and it could have been. They could, if they needed this parking, it could have been in the SPUD that we voted on a year ago. Um, I think, and Kenny, I would just, I would just ask you, um, if, this, if we were to accept the, the Planning Commission's recommendation recommendation to vote this down and deny it, and then this were to end up in district court. The district court is basically looking for that we have a, a reasonable justification for denying it. Not, I mean, they're not, they're not coming in and, and deciding whether we're right or not on the zoning. They want to know, did you just come to an arbitrary and capricious decision, uh, or did you have a reasonable justification? Is that an accurate summary of what would happen? In, if you have a, reason, a reasonable land use justification for denying the application and 
uh, reasonable minds can differ. They call it the fairly debatable rule of reasonable minds can differ whether or not the rezoning should be granted or not granted based on some rational land use reason, then usually the court defers to the city. Okay, well I, would, I see several members from the neighborhood and I'll defer to them and they can, they can spell out their reasons. But to me, and we got into this with, with John's case a couple weeks ago, one of the primary purposes of a SPUD is to negotiate between the development and the impact on the surrounding area. Um, the problem with John's is, I mean, they hadn't even, the developer hadn't even talked to the neighborhood, so I don't know how a SPUD is an appropriate negotiation tool. But here, there was, there was negotiations, there was many meetings, and in all those original um, presentations and drawings, this area was to remain R1 and was to remain, uh, was not to be surface parking lot. So this represents a change after uh, the, the initial negotiations with the neighborhood. Um, we don't know, uh, again, what the use is going to be here. And so just as they were burned before by a diesel generator putting back there, if we don't even know who the tenant is going to be in that building, we can't know what kind of accompanying infrastructure is going to be necessary, what kind of smells might come from whatever, or noises, or, or, or whatever. We can't understand the impact to the neighborhood. Um, I, I suspect that possibly what's happening is that this is, is being combined to make it more sellable, to make it a larger, contiguous tract of land that then they can sell to another entity, which is what Chesapeake's doing throughout uh, Ward 2 in the city. Uh, and so we could, this, um, a lot of, of the arguments made last June, I believe, were that we know what Chesapeake's landscaping abilities are and we trust that that, but there's no guarantee that this is going to be Chesapeake that's going to be developing. This could be an OnQ or a Circle K or uh, any other number of uh, uh, developers. Uh, can you show the next one, the next slide, Boyd? The other problem is that then it established precedent for um, for future, just to the right of this is the existing gas station on the south of 49th that Chesapeake also owns. If we approve this today, what would, what would then stop them from tearing this house down, which Chesapeake also owns, which is right across the street from this empty lot. They can tear this down and then after they develop this on 50th and Western, there'll be no need for this gas station. It has C4 zoning, highly intense. So they could tear down this house and then combine surface parking lot with this and do some um, highly intensive uh, development right next to the neighborhood. There would be no stopping it. There would be no, no stopping the dominoes all the way down Western or through Ward 2 or anywhere else in the city. If people can just come in, buy a house for 135000 tear it down, uh, and then after changing the facts on the ground, then start talking with the neighborhood and then start applying for zoning. Um, uh, there, it, would, it would establish a, a terrible precedent. I'm going um, to stop there and just and let the, if Dennis wants to, to talk in the neighborhood. Yeah, several people signed up to speak okay. on this issue. How good. would you like to proceed then? I'd, I'd like to hear from the neighborhood. Right. Uh, Joel and Aaron, would you come up here, please? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. You all may sit down now. I know those chairs are uncomfortable. But... Can we have your name and address of the record, yes. please? Yes, my name is Joellen Aaron. I live at 920 Northwest 49th Street, and I have lived on that street for 40 years. So I have a pretty good idea of what has gone into the neighborhood, how it has changed, and how it has developed. Um, Councilman Shadid sort of stole part of my thunder. Uh, so <laughs> um, concerning the uh, SPUD 662, Chesapeake has already started to abandon the promises that they made to the residents on SPUD 662. That's the 24-hour convenience store and 20-pump station, as well as the um, re the restaurant or uh, retail that is located on the corner of 49th and Western. They tore down the house at 100 uh, 1009, and that green belt was to have been had a site fence on it and landscaping. 
purchasing two residential lots contiguous to the commercial property tells us that they had more on their agenda for the future. Why does Chesapeake not present a full plan to the city and to the residents so that intelligent, comprehensive plans for traffic, parking, design, etc., can be looked at as a whole? The entire project, if the entire project were revealed, were they certain that it would have been denied? They have a history of chipping away at the neighborhoods, needing a little more of this and a little more here, coming back time after time, none of which we feel serves the city nor serves the neighborhoods. Our fear, which is based on past history, is that if the property in question is rezoned commercial, it will set a precedence for Chesapeake to come back and attempt to chip away at 1008 on 49. This perfectly good house, which they own, is directly behind the current CNG. They have told us the CNG will be torn down. We feel that they will demolish that house. It will be a replay of this application before you today, with one exception. That property sits above, ground, above the grade from Western Avenue. They will probably grade it back to the east so that it will appear as one large commercial property. It will be presented to the city as this one was, after all, it's a vacant lot. Well, it wasn't vacant until they demolished the house. Aaron, I don't mean to interrupt you, but could you focus on the application we have in front of us, please? I, I know this is in the future, and what may or may not happen is, is uh, something I we'll have to deal I understand, but when we get I there. also feel that, this, that in order to have a good idea, you've got to look, have a little bit of history. Well, we've got quite a bit the of history. The type of chipping away continues to be allowed. What is there to stop anyone from chipping away at the neighborhoods? All they have to do is tear down a house to get the rezoning approved. We have heard in these chambers that Chesapeake does a lot for the city. We don't deny that. And we're grateful for that. But we also do not feel that our contributions to the city should be viewed as less. We choose to live in the city, to raise our children, and to support the city. We are invested in our homes, pay our taxes, maintain our property. We serve in the military, we educate your children, we are doctors, lawyers, entrepreneurs, Chesapeake employees, city and state employees. This, this precedence of chipping away at established viable neighborhoods is not in the best interest of the community. And we ask you to please deny this uh, 705. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, John Cousins. And Mr. Cousins, would you come up and give your name and address to the record, please? Okay, and I'll be brief. If My you could not repeat what we've heard before, I think I, I will. Okay. My name is John Cousins, and I live at 400 Northwest 44th Street. That's within the Douglas Edgemere neighborhood. And um, at the Planning Commission, I just wanted to point out a couple of things about similar properties up and down the uh, corridor of Western. The applicant brought up that this bank extends further east than their current zoning. And um, that is true, but there's some differences. The applicant's SPUD 662 is a 24-7 operation. That's something brand new for Western. The bank has to be closed by 7 o'clock. And it was built on land that didn't have any structures. It was a parking lot for the first uh, Crown Heights Baptist Church. and. Uh, so with that spud for that bank, that every one of these uh, examples of property, commercial property going eastward has unique circumstance. That didn't have any structure. It's good that we have a business along that, that street, and it didn't tear out any houses. Then you go further down to uh, Will Rogers Theater, and they've got a big parking lot in back there. Well, that was a spud. That whole spud application was only 10 pages long because that was back in 1981. So for Chesapeake to argue that this is consistent with the rest of Western, it's different. This is a 24-7 operation. And what we have seen when you have unparalleled encroachment, like with the Will Rogers 
parking lot, then the housing across the street diminishes. And I provided some pictures of some housing in our neighborhood. It's the same with on 44th Street by Catch Design Studio, where you have the commercial, and just north of it, you have the homes. They've fallen into disrepair, and they're vacant. And that's our concern for this street, is that it, it will just kind of erode. You know how things fall apart, and we're concerned we'll have that same um, trend here when we know that people are building homes in the neighborhood. Um, we've had four new homes built on empty lots, and they all have housing values of over $125 a square foot. We have a couple of people that are builders that would love to rebuild that home. That's a hot area of town for walkability. We're going to have the streetscape. And we just asked the council to help contain it at this. When we got together a year ago, we talked, John Belt organized everybody in his office, neighborhoods and businesses, and we had a deal. And our deal was to stop the development at the R1. And I feel like our deal's not being honored. And I ask you to deny this and, and help protect the neighborhood. It's one of your top five priorities, and this is definitely a vibrant neighborhood, and I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Uh, Martha, Jeff? And if you, if you give us your name and address for the record, please. My name is Martha Jett. I live at 4914 North Harvey Parkway. I am the president of the Douglas Edgemere Neighborhood Association. I moved into my home in 1995, one month after the Oklahoma City bombing. I lived at far northwest Oklahoma City. This was my destination. I could have lived anywhere in the city of Oklahoma City. This is where I wanted to live. This is where I chose to live, and I felt very fortunate to even find something available there. This is a vibrant neighborhood. We have a park right in the core of our neighborhood, which there are almost 700 homes. We have new sidewalks from the 20, 2007 bond issue. There is activity in our park all the time. We're more of a community, the community than just some random housing development. We worked with Chesapeake on SPUD 662. They presented it. We worked with them to, for protection of our neighborhood with this huge commercial development coming in. Um, there are certain guarantees they made to us, and we did not protest 662. Now we feel like they have come back, and this, we don't like to call this a vacant lot. This is a developable residential lot. It did have a home. It had people living in the home. It wasn't an abandoned property. And we feel like they've just been disingenuous with us, and we feel like we're here today to ask you to please enforce the deal that was made in, in SPUD 662. Help protect residential property from commercialism. And when a deal has been made, it, it, one needs to be held responsible. And we have done our part. We would like Chesapeake to do their part. Therefore, I'm denying. I'm asking you to deny 705. Thank you very much, Ms. We appreciate your coming down here. Uh, Albert Janko. Thank you. Name and address for the record, I'm please. Albert Janko. I live on the northwest corner of 49th and Chartel and have lived there continuously since January of 1950. And when we moved there, I would, as a sidelight, I'd like to mention that Chartel was not paved from 49th to 50th, and we uh, the individual property owners, including my family, paid to sh pave Chartel. It was not paved then. I have two strong objections to your continuing to consider this agenda item. Number one, buried in the attached documents but not mentioned in the official uh, agenda item is the possibility of still closing 49th Street at Western. 
It is not clear, but the way I read the attached documents, which you have to spend some time to find in the, uh, in the attached documents, is the possibility of still closing 49th Street, which I strongly object to and needs to be discussed in more detail by this council. The other item that I have a problem with, a serious problem with, is the method of official notice. As I mentioned to you, I live on the northwest corner of 49th and Chartel, which is over the statutory requirement for giving notice required, I assume, by state law and also city ordinance of 300 feet. And that is woefully inadequate, and I, to this date, to this minute, have not received any official notice about this action. I did receive, about a week ago, seven or eight days ago, an anonymous, what I consider an anonymous email message that was not from the city. It was signed uh, without specific names, mentioning that this would be an agenda item, and I immediately went to start looking at it. So what I'm suggesting and strongly recommend that the city adopt and provide to its citizens adequate notice and to em enhance the notice, and I call to your attention one possibility, although this is not the complete solution, but needs to be discussed in great detail. If you go to Edmond, Oklahoma, as I was a few months ago, and driving down one of the streets, I notice on a piece of property a big sign up there with a notice, an official notice of a proposed rezoning of that property, where anybody in that neighborhood gets at least that notice. Of course, they have to drive by and know about it, but I say that the city of Oklahoma City is not serving its citizens by giving adequate uh, notice, Albert, I don't hate including... To, Albert, I hate to interrupt you, but can you put uh, your comments on, directly to this particular application? Okay, well, any okay, well then I'd like to re-mention and I'll come end my remarks with this issue of the possibility of still having 49th Street at Western closed in the attachments that accompany what's on the website, but not in what I'm holding in my hand. Thank you. Thank you, Albert. Uh, Roberta is on. Rebecca, I'm sorry, Rebecca is on. And we have, may have, and may we have your name and address for the record, please? Uh, yes, my name is Rebecca Zahn Pitzer. I live at 917 Northwest 49th Street. Um, and good morning, council members. Uh, on a couple of a couple of things, granted, trying not to repeat what's, what we've already heard we this appreciate morning. Appreciate that very much. Um, hearing uh, my fellow neighbors this morning reminded me of our relationship with Chesapeake has gone a lot longer than this. Uh, the development at 50th and Western. I moved in in 2008, and I'm a little unusual. I actually called call the neighborhood associate, found out there was a neighborhood association when I was looking at the neighborhood, called the neighborhood association president, had looked up Oklahoma County records and knew that several properties were owned by Chesapeake, and called the president and said, what gives? Uh, what do we know about Chesapeake? What are we hearing from Chesapeake? Um, we know they own several properties, and heard at that time before I even moved into the neighborhood, oh, uh, Chesapeake is telling us that they're really not going to buy any more property in the, in, the, in the area, in the neighborhood. It's really the farthest that they're going to encroach. Shortly after I moved in to my home, um, they bought the property right behind me on 50th um, that they demolished as part of the uh, PUD uh, 662. Um, they bought, and several years later, they bought the house at the corner, 10,009 Northwest 49th Street. And literally one day I leave for work, come home that day, the house is gone. Um, and so actually since 2008, I feel like we haven't been getting the full story from Chesapeake. 
Um, we worked with them on the PUD 662, and regarding the PUD uh, 705, again, we are asking uh, for denial of this zoning change. Um, you have heard and you have probably 70 pages of protest letters and examples of new housing that's going in. Uh, one new development that's going in right now, we have a new house at 47th and Lee, diagonally across from the park. So it's still happening. These houses weren't built, the houses were built several years ago, but we have a house being built right now that's new. Uh, we've been told, of course, unofficially, that we have developers that would be very interested in our neighborhood because we have a very favorable, well-liked neighborhood, especially where it's located, especially for Chesapeake employees. Um, we have a lot of Chesapeake employees living in our neighborhood. Um, so there is an interest in the house, that property would probably not stay vacant. If it were sold and the house could be put back on it. So it would not be a waste of space. Um, going back to the goals of City of Oklahoma City, happen to know a little bit about a uh, housing plan. The City of Oklahoma City has to provide a housing plan, consolidated plan, uh, to Office of Housing and Urban Development every year. And I, I pulled up the fourth year of the five-year plan from 2010 to 2015, and I read the goals. The three main goals um, for the housing plan, um, provision of decent housing, the provision of suitable living environment, and e expanding economic development opportunities principally for person low or moderate income. Now granted, I know this is not uh, everything that the City of Oklahoma City does, but I found it very interesting in reading about, in reading in the plan, how vital housing is, affordable housing is, keeping housing, improving housing, building new housing. And it doesn't make sense to me that, or would it be a lot easier to keep and gain housing if we keep businesses from demolishing good affordable housing? This is a good, moderate income neighborhood, and we need to keep these houses intact, um, and that didn't happen. So what's the next step? Let's put a house back on there. The only way we can put a house back on there is if you deny this PUD and it's allowed to stay residential. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your comments. Um, Ed, uh, that, uh, is there anybody else who would like to, to uh, speak on opposition to this particular PUD that hasn't signed up already, that has anything new to bring to the table? Well, thank you very much. Ed, how would you like to proceed now? You're on, Dennis. It uh, is a pleasure, and Dr. Shadid, I think you've done an excellent job in, in uh, making the points that you've made. Dennis Box, 522 Colcord Drive, but I want to point out to this council what we're really talking about. The points that have been brought up deal with um, issues that aren't issues on this property. I know you all have diligently read your staff report, and there's a couple of things that you'll find interesting on the staff report. Number one, we are in conformance with the plan. Number two, this is a single-use spud. We have 25 feet on the east side that's going to be totally landscaping. On the other 25 feet of this 50-foot lot, we're going to have four parking spaces at the north end, and we're going to have five feet of area that will uh, take care of eight parking spaces that uh, are on the lot to the west of us. So the first example you saw about the generator, this is a single-use spud. And Mr. Johnson, you might show the exhibit. The exhibit will give you an example of what we attempted to do. And it's kind of interesting what a difference a year makes. I mean, I feel like uh, Chesapeake is uh, uh, on trial for uh, um, things that uh, people have accused them of doing, and yet Chesapeake, I think, has made a wonderful contribution to this city. And when we're talking about this case, we've talked all around it. We've talked about the bank and the generator. We've talked about SPED 662, none of which deals with this case. What does deal with this case? We have committed to this site plan. We have committed to exactly what you see. 
Now, why are we asking for it? Number one, for the last at least five years, your planning staff has, has said we need to come up to the standards that you see around the country where you see buildings in the new urbanized areas pushed up to the street and have parking behind them. Well, that has not taken off very well. It's been very difficult. Chesapeake decided they would go along with that and try to do it. So what you see is a building that's pushed up to the street level and therefore the parking that we've shown. Um, that's why this case, if you'll look at it, is in conformance with the plan. Now there's been a lot of discussion about housing in the plan and different things, but the experts tell you this is in conformance with the plan. If you'll look at the reasoning given by the, by the planning commission, and there was some debate about, well, why would we talk about the bank and the parking lot? Well, if you look at the reasoning, the reasoning was that this would provide commercial encroachment into an adjacent neighborhood. And there was a lot of discussion in the Planning Commission about this line that had been drawn. And so if you'll look at the zoning map that sits uh, in your staff report and sits up on the board, uh, there is not a line. And in fact, if you go down to the south, you're going to find examples like the bank, the parking lot, and others that uh, uh, provide for a line that meanders based on uh, the individual case that's brought before you. And I'd submit to you that the individual case that we present where we don't have any access from this 50-foot lot onto the residential area, where we have 25 feet of landscaped area and have a minimum area, it's actually 21 feet of landscaped area, a minimum of five feet for these parking spaces and the four parking spaces here is a good use of the property. And it achieves the goals that your planning staff has said they want to see happen. Now there was some discussion about a deal that had not been followed through. I know of no deal that has not been complied with. In fact, the property on 662 has not even been uh, developed yet. Now when we talk about a deal, Mr. Johnson and I, on behalf of Chesapeake, sat down with the neighbors who are here, very good people, um, trying to make sure that their area is protected. And one of the things we heard was, why don't you come in and down zone the C4, keeping in mind when we're talking about SPUD 662, a portion of that property was zoned C4, and you all as council persons know that that's the most intensive commercial zoning Oklahoma City has. If you look at 662, we took out a lot of those uses. One of the things we tried to do to protect the neighborhood was to close 49th Street. There would, would have been a hammerhead where this vacant lot was and down zone C4 into a spud. That was actually going through the process when the uh, uh, residents decided that that was not something that they wanted. Therefore, we withdrew it. But that doesn't have anything to do with the zoning that you all have in front of you. And the zoning you have in front of you, I submit, if you implement the standard that uh, your legal counsel was talking about, where do you go to? Well, you go to the planners. You go to your plan. And what does it call for? It calls for this to be in compliance and a recommendation for approval. So when we talk about Chesapeake, I am um, mindful that some people might not like Chesapeake. I think Chesapeake has done a wonderful job in Oklahoma City, all around the city, doing great things for Oklahoma City. And what Chesapeake attempted to do here was not some devious, deal-breaking zoning case. They attempted to do what your staff has been trying to get commercial developers to do for a long time. Push the building up to the frontage on the street and have the parking behind the building. So we'd ask for your approval. Dennis, can I just ask one question? This, this would have 42 parking spaces around that building on 49th and Western. Can you tell us what the use is going to be in that building, who the tenant is, or not the name, but 
What's the purpose? If I knew I could, but I don't know. So you're, you're, the applicant hasn't divulged to you who the tenant is. That is correct. Or what the use is. That is correct. But That's I don't correct. think it matters because the building is going to sit on SPUD 662. Okay. Whoever is in that building will have to comply Can I ask that. Russell a question, please? So, Russell, the, the traffic commissioner, the planning commissioner, the city council for this ward are all against this. The planning commission voted for denial. The neighborhood's against it. Every entity other than the applicant has, has against it. You heard uh, Dennis talk a link that the, that the staff report recommended for approval and that, and that it's in compliance and that we're just doing what you wanted. And so I'd ask, because it, in the report, it does, it does identify that there are some policies that conflict with, with, with our policies, namely that we emphasize preservation of existing housing stock through rehabilitation over demolition. So I guess I'd, I'd ask, when, you, when, you're, when, when we come to the um, decision to recommend approval, are you looking at it at face value after the fact that the house has already been torn down? In other words, would there be a difference if the house was still there and they came to you and they said, uh, Russell, what would you think about us tearing down this house and then converting it to surface parking lot? Would there be a different outcome versus tearing the house down and then coming to you and asking you to look at it? Uh, we do take it at face value. So we looked at the lot as an empty lot. If the house was still there, uh, I think we would have come to a different conclusion. If the house was still there, you would have let but We're very concerned about the encroachment into residential areas. We've had a number of uh, applications in recent time on Classen, for example, and in most of those cases we have uh, opposed that encroachment. Um, Mr. Box talked about a line, and yes, that line varies. Uh, it's pretty clear here in this particular case that the community um, uh, is, is opposed to any further encroachment into the area. Uh, that's not something that we are privy to when we're also deliberating on each individual application. And that's part of the flexibility of the plan. The plan provides that flexibility. And that's where the decision making of the Planning Commission and the City Council comes into play to take into account a lot of other considerations that we're not privy to at the time that we review the application. Okay. If there are, not any, if there are any questions from Council? Uh, I do have a concern any time that neighborhoods uh, protest a particular spud or put, um, I take a very close look at it. Um, and so I definitely agree with Councilman uh, Shadi's remarks as relates to this uh, case. I'm kind of confused, all right? Uh, earlier today, uh, we heard from a neighborhood just to the north of here uh, and Russell, if you would, I, I could just, okay. We were from a neighborhood north of here that was threatened at one time, am I correct, by the incursion of uh, Chesapeake and the, uh, the fear that they would lose all their, uh, their identity and, and, and the investment that they had in that neighborhood over years? Is, is that not the case? That, that's correct. Okay. And, and the gentleman, Rob, I think he's still sitting back here, indicated that the neighborhood and Chesapeake got together and came out with a plan that uh, he seemed to, to, to convey to, to me that the neighbors really, really liked when the final plan that came up. Uh, is that a, am, am I missing something here? No, no, that would be correct. I think there was a gradual encroachment. There were sort of several okay. different acquisitions of property within the neighborhood, and the neighborhood was uh, unsure as to what the final plan for Chesapeake was. So. They got together and they determined what that line was going to be. And then, in addition to that, we have a strengthening neighborhoods initiative, which Western Avenue is it not uh, benefiting from, which is to uh, develop a business improvement district along Western Avenue, further to the north, all the way down to Northwest uh, 36th Street, I believe, if not further south. Well, there, there already is a bid there to the south. Well, actually, that includes this area here. And right. that bid is to promote growth Correct. of commercial activity along uh, Western Avenue, it, is it not? Well, it's to support the existing uh, commercial entities along, uh, that, that along Western of. Avenue. So. That, that's, that's my confusion on this. And uh, quite frankly, my, my recommendation is, is to, uh, to get back to the table 
and see if you can't come up with a, a workable solution between the neighbors and Chesapeake, because I think there's one out there. Thank you. Ed, you, where would you, how would you like to proceed now? I, I, I'd move for denial. A motion made and second to deny it. Is let, there any further me, comments or questions? Let me make a comment about that. I, I see Rob stood up back there. And I, I watched that frustration that went on there. And I think to characterize that as a wonderful compromise, it was only a compromise after Chesapeake bought all the property, tore down all the houses. These people felt like they were totally helpless. And they, went, they sat down at the table and made a resolution that under those circumstances was a decent deal. Is that... Rob, is that a fair uh, analysis of what happened? Again, Rob Littlefield, 1148 Northwest 56th Street. Uh, Meadowbrook Acres is also on the Western Avenue corridor. We're very, very much involved with the Western Avenue corridor. We care about it. We're members of the Western Avenue bid. The fundamental difference between the experiences that Meadowbrook Acres had and what's going on here and what we're looking at today is that there were actually structures there with the first phase of that spud. The first spud, or it was actually a PUD for the class and curve, the buildings went up, they were built, they were there. And it was after that fact that Chesapeake recognized that they had a need for more parking spaces to accommodate the tenants that were moving into that thing. There is nothing at Northwest 50th and Western Avenue. There's nothing built there. There is nothing to justify the need for any side to need more parking spaces. That's the fundamental difference. And it, it's a huge difference. And, and the other difference that, that I want to point out is that the Class and Curve Shopping Center was vacant land on, on uh, the Class and Quarter facing Rose Hill Cemetery facing to the west. There was nothing there. It was owned by Don Karchmer, Jack Sargent, I believe. It was the residential projects on Military Avenue that backed up to that. So it's, it's a different animal. It's, it's a different thing. And I, I just don't think it's a good idea in this day and age to tear down really good residential opportunities for parking lots. The original spud on 50th and Western had all the uses in it. It showed all the structures that, that were going to be in there. And I know darn well that when structures and uses are put into a spud, there is an analysis about how many parking spaces those structures are required to have. And it was approved. And now they're coming back for more. So that, that's, does that give you some clarity, Councilman, of, of the difference between the two? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Yes. I'd just like to respond to two things. One, um, to characterize uh, class and curve as some kind of uh, um, process that Chesapeake uh, took advantage of the neighbors, I think is uh, not appropriate. We had countless meetings, not only in Rob's um, house, but also at Chesapeake campus. And our whole goal was to make sure that we had a uh, commercial center that the neighbors could be proud of and vice versa. We work with them. Same in this case, we don't have the same result, but in the middle of this process, when we started talking to the neighbors, one of the things we said was, if you're worried about commercial encroachment coming off Western, and you all hear it on case after case, if you want to, we will file a closing application and we will downzone our property as zone C4. So. In the middle of that process, the neighbors decided that wasn't something they wanted to do anymore. But that was our attempt to try to work with the neighbors and make sure that we had the same end result that we had at the class and curve. So that was a long process. And yes, my, my comments were, were not designed to disparage Chesapeake. They were designed to point out the disparity between the power that's perceived this neighborhood has and the power that Chesapeake has. You and I both know that Chesapeake paid enormous sums of money for houses that were worth a tenth of what they paid for them in order to gain that leverage. The neighborhood doesn't have that kind of leverage. 
And that's my point. It's not that Chesapeake then didn't take some of this bucket fulls of money they have and give it all away. I, I couldn't agree more that they've been a good corporate citizen in that regard. But there is a huge disparity between people's perception of their power and the power that somebody like Chesapeake has. And that's all I was trying to point out. I wouldn't want this to be uh, to get down to whether people like or dislike Chesapeake. I mean, what's not to like about the kind of corporate citizen they've been at the philanthropic level? I'm talking about the down where the rubber meets the road, where they're buying the house next door to you and turning it down. The guy that lives next to that house doesn't have the power to buy that house and turn it down and turn it into a community garden. He doesn't have the cash to do that with. And that's where the disparity comes from. That's where this conflict arose. That's where it arose in Rob's neighborhood. Is it, it, it eventually worked out. But it worked out with one side having all the power and the, and the neighborhood just finally being able to get the power to draw the line somewhere. And I think that's what we're seeing here. I, don't take this as an anti-Chesapeake uh, uh, comment because it's not intended to be that at all. Well, I appreciate your saying that because um, in 32 years, I can't remember a scenario where I've had a zoning case and um, it was 30 minutes before the applicant got a chance to even state what their position was in regard to a different case and talked about everything except for the zoning case that's being presented. In this case, I think it's important to note that Chesapeake's not coming in here and wanting to, to put buildings further into the neighborhood. In fact, they've, they've taken that east portion and made sure that it would be all um, landscaping. They've not had any access on the 49th Street. And so what they've tried to do is come up with a plan that they think would be harmonious and be better for the neighborhood. I guess if I would lived in the neighborhood, my concern about sitting down and making another deal would be what would prevent Chesapeake from coming in and paying a quarter of a million dollars for a hundred thousand dollar house next door to this one and then doing the same thing. And then once it's leveled, then we get this snapshot based on the way things are today and the neighborhood then is behind the eight ball again on the a staff report that says it's favorable which it would not have been favorable if this whole plan might have been laid out all at once and efforts were made a year ago to try to continue this and and try to make that happen and the council decided not to do that and now the chickens are coming home to roost right now because that wasn't the whole plan and, and once, you get the, once the whole plan gets on the table, I think everybody has a reasonable way to deal with the plan, whatever it is. Whether you like it or don't like it, you, you've got planners, you've got lawyers, you've got engineers, you've got all these people that can figure it all out. And, and this council will come to a good decision. But if you don't put it all on the table, like your situation now, you, can't, you don't know what's going to be there. Now you can say that's not relevant to this, and I can, I can understand from your perspective it isn't relevant. But to those people it's relevant. Yeah, Even but, though they may not have a right to know under the law, it's relevant to them to make a decision based on what they're going to be next to. Oh, they, and, they, they know exactly what they'll be next to, and that's the zoning that's in front of you. No, they don't, Dennis, because they don't know what's going to happen to the house next to that. They don't know, they've watched Chesapeake operate and they don't know what's going to happen to the next house. They don't know, and that, I'm not saying there's anything illegal about that. Don't, don't take me someplace I don't want to be. Well, I guess that's your, that's your job as a lawyer, take me wherever you can push me. But uh, my job as a lawyer is to stay out of that hole you want to put me in. And I don't want to be in that hole. I think it, it's a lack of pure candor on the part of, of your client, really. And I don't, there's nothing illegal about that. It's probably not unethical or immoral, but it, it drives down these people's confidence that they know what's going to happen tomorrow. And I think that's where we are. I think, Dennis, it's, it's hard to look at this just in a vacuum. There is a lot of history. I mean, but one of the main reasons I'm here is that this incremental conflict with the neighborhoods and the applicant is what led my predecessor, Sam Bowman, to decide not to run again. I mean, it has worn out a lot of people. It's not healthy for the city, this constant tension between Chesapeake and neighborhoods. I mean, that Meadowbrook Apron came to a silence when Chesapeake signed a contract to buy no more houses. That's what I think really turned the corner. We need Chesapeake to be a great oil and gas company. 
That's the bottom line. And I think that's why their stock is increasing and the companies turning around is they're focusing on oil and gas and doing the things that they do great. This tension in real estate development with the neighborhoods and the incremental changes and not revealing the whole master plan is not healthy for the city. Thanks. Ed, you, it's a, so, a motion made and second to deny the application. Uh, an affirmative vote would uh, result in the denial. Uh, is there any further comments or questions? Please cast your votes. And the item is uh, denied. No, please, please, no, no, no outbursts. Thank you very much. It's on a final hearing for the Parks and Recreation, Cultural Affairs, et cetera, of Oklahoma City Municipal Code 2010, Amendor Chapter 38. This is the final hearing. Does anybody would like to speak on item uh, that is 8E? Uh, let, me, let me say a little bit of background on it. The Lake Atoka Association, of which Oklahoma City is a member, um, uh, uh, moved this, asked for this ordinance to be done in order to protect the the new infrastructure that we're putting in place in uh, at the Lake Atoka area to make it more accessible and more user friendly, and that's all. That's really all it's about. Is there any member from the public who would like to make a comment on this proposed change? I move it. Motion made and second. Is there any further discussion? Please cast your votes, and that item is approved. Thank you very much. Item. 8F is next. It's a public hearing and the final adoption relating to uh, item one is animals uh, amending uh, Oklahoma City Municipal Code 2010, Chapter 8, Article 1, Division 5, Section 8-50, disposition of unclaimed, relinquished, and abandoned animals to include friendly socialized cats as cats eligible for the community cats project. Is there anybody like to speak on this particular project? Bob Tiener does. Uh, Bob Tiener will, be, you know, will present both items F1 and F2, and this is the first of the, of, of the uh, this is the introduction today, and so it'll be before council two more times on, on this item. And uh, with that, Bob. First item, F1, really two different changes. Uh, one change is just a uh, uh, correcting a typographic error. We put in sterilized and it should have been vaccinated. Uh, the second, and probably the most important, is a change to allow in the community cat program cats that are uh, caught in the program that are really not feral cats but are socialized, friendly cats. This gives uh, us the ability not to have to euthanize those animals. It amounts to about somewhere between 100 and 200 a uh, cats a year is all. So it's really a minor amendment. And those are the two changes to F1. And then F2 is, uh, this is a result of our budget preparation. We went through the fees at Animal Welfare uh, and just, this is an update. Several of these fees we didn't, we hadn't used in a long time and so we deleted some of those. Then we tried to bring some others up to market value. Uh, I mean the primary changes, we increased our fees on vaccinations to a, a market rate. It's still, it went from 10 to $15. And then our probably biggest one is changing our adoption rate from $50 to $60. And if anybody has any questions? Bob, it really is a goal to get these pets adopted out of the shelter. So have you been able to test the market a little bit and be sure that that increase from 50 to 60 won't have a significant impact? We talked with our partners, with the Humane Society, and, and nobody felt that that $10 increase was going to impact our our adoption rates. And we do have some programs throughout the year where we waive those fees and there we've got free adoptions other than the spaying and neutering fees. So That's correct. We, we found that animals that are over six months old are harder to adopt so we'll do a, a monthly or semi maybe every other month a program in the in the shelter to try to adopt those animals out. Can you comment just a teeny bit on the impact that last week's devastating tornadoes have had to the number of animals? in our shelters and? I don't have a number. Uh, we worked with boar. We had um, or family farm. We had several horses that were injured. Uh, they took care of most of that. We did have four that we had to pick up. Um, we, were, we were a uh, location where people brought animals. Uh, primarily more worked with Norman and most of the animals were taken to the, the Norman shelter. 
Uh, I don't have a total number, but we had several uh, uh, that we took there. Well, a couple of my colleagues were talking earlier about the cooperation of people coming from out of state. I was delighted to see a whole group of people from the Oregon Humane Society that were here over the weekend mm -hmm. uh, helping our own folks um, in working to try to reunite pets with their families. And you know, in being out in the, in the area that Tuesday morning, the next morning, I could see pets fully tagged, you know, fully, but they're... The house was gone where they used to live, and they're just kind of trying to figure out what was going on. You know, where's home? Where's the people that look after me? And I can, uh, I, I got that, you know, just kind of as a small sense of the, of the massive problem that animal welfare had to deal with that day. Um, and I, and I, I hope it turned out as well as it could, you know, in, in, in many instances. That had to be, you know, just a nightmare situation for that department. Yeah, we, we offered the assistance to more, and then we took care of the ones that, that were in Oak. Oklahoma City's part of it, and uh, it seemed to go okay, you know, but I'd, I'll get you some numbers. Uh, I didn't have those. Yeah, I would love to see numbers if, if, of uh, how many people are, you know, might still be missing a pet. Uh, okay. Would probably be, you know, be good to know. Any other comments or questions here on this item? Move the item, setting it for hearing. All right, we're voting on item 8F1. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. We have a motion on item 8F2. This has to do with the feral cats. Second. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 8G is a public hearing regarding dilapidated structures. Is there anyone here wishing to speak on any item listed under 8G? Yes. All right. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 8H is a public hearing regarding unsecured structures. Is there anyone here wishing to speak under any item listed under 8H? All right, how about a motion? Cast your votes. Pass unanimously. Item 8I has to do with the allocation for a housing project. And this is in Ward 7. John, have you been briefed on this and feel good about it? Uh, yes, I have been. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I have been briefed about this um, particular project. Matter of fact, we have had several meetings and site visits uh, as it relates to this um, particular project. I move for uh, approval. All right. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. We're voting on item 8I. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8J is a revocable right-of-way uh, permit request for the Red Earth uh, event. Is there anyone here representing this event? I see Eric here. Why don't you? Eric, come on up. We will need your name and address for the record, please. My name is Eric A. I live at 2300 Northwest 161st Street. And we'd love to hear more about the parade and the event coming up. This will be our 27th annual Red Earth Festival, and the parade will kick off our event on Friday, June the 7th. Our plans are to sta have a staging area on Southwest 2nd, one block south of the Myriad uh, Gardens, and then the parade will circle the gardens. We, have, we expect about 100 entries in the parade and several thousand people to line the streets. That'll be great. Any comments or questions on this event? Just that it's an absolutely wonderful spectacle for downtown Oklahoma City, I hope. Lots of people will turn out and then head up for the couple of days of festivities at the Cox Center. So thank, thank you, you, Eric, for all your great hard work. And we want people to stop by and visit the museum. That's correct. Our, mu our, our museum is in Santa Fe Parking. All right. Great. Meg, how thank about you. a motion? Uh, move approval, please. All right. We're voting on item 8J. Is there a second? Thank you. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Thank you. Thanks and good luck. Item 8K is a request to hold the Klassen 10 Pen Community Festival. This is also in Ward 6. It will take place on June 8th. Is there anyone here representing this event? All right, Meg, you want to make yeah. a motion? Larry, I think you and I share lots of this neighborhood as well, and it's just so nice to see uh, the Klassen 10 Pen neighborhood getting together to hold their community festival. It will be in McKinley Park uh, on June 8th, which is a busy, busy weekend in Oklahoma City. I would move approval. All right, we're voting on item 8K. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. That was 8K1. I, item 8K2 is a request from the Perry Publishing and Broadcasting Company to hold the Juneteenth Festival. This is in Ward 7. Is there anyone here representing this event? All right, John, you want to comment? All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the, I want to first of all thank uh, Perry Broadcasting Communication for holding this uh, historical uh, event. And so um, I uh, will move for approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. We're voting on item 8K2. Cast your votes. And it passed unanimously. 
And item 8L is a resolution receiving an amendment to the OKC plan. I think Russell's going to give us more information. He is as soon as he gets his PowerPoint up. Okay. Morning, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm here today to talk about uh, our employment land study that uh, the Council adopted last year in on October. And as a result of that, one of the recommendations, well, a number of the recommendations relate to adjustments to the comprehensive plan. And this is the first of those. This is a, basically an interim change to be able to, to protect the lands that we've ident were identified in the plan until such time as the comprehensive plan is finalized. I'm going to give a little bit of update, uh, a little bit of um, um, background um, on the employment lands because we have a couple of new council people here today to let you know where we got to. Uh, this study was originally undertaken because we were hearing increasing concerns about the ability to be able to uh, find adequate serviced land for large employers. Uh, the Chamber continues to tell us that this is a huge issue for them. I believe Roy Williams in his presentation uh, a few weeks ago uh, brought that up again that they were unable to find anything on the south side. So this study was undertaken in conjunction with the Chamber of Commerce, the Alliance for Economic Development and several uh, private partners to identify what the extent of uh, our need was, uh, what the issues were and then what some of the solutions uh, may be. Uh, challenges as indicated here, uh, parcelization of land, we might have a lot of land but a lot of it is divided up into multiple different ownerships and that causes problems for being able to have a large enough assembled site. Infrastructure is not service, does not service the entire community. Some of the areas that we had designated as industrial in the comprehensive plan are still a long way uh, away from uh, available infrastructure. That infrastructure in the future is going to need to be directed towards those sites to enable them to be development ready. Uh, private sector is also, as we know, relatively impatient when it comes to holding land. So those who have held some of those uh, eligible parcels uh, have um, been offered other options for that land and have developed it in many cases for residential, which has caused um, uh, larger problems for the area around that, which may still be zoned uh, industrial because a lot of these uh, major employees do not want to locate close to residential. So it takes out large areas of land. Uh, the original uh, plan, as I said, was uh, to do uh, an inventory of, of what was out there and what our needs would be, and then to develop an action plan focused on uh, land uh, essentially in the 50 to 100 acre um, category, because those are the pieces that, that, we're find, that the Chamber is finding very difficult to, uh, to be able to locate, and then recommend steps to protect those lands to be able to assemble uh, properties that meet that criteria, to be able to serve the infrastructure of those areas and, um, and then also to Im improve those areas over time. Um, I think I've talked about this. I'm going to go skip over some of this. Uh, our, our annual absorption is about 80 acres. The difficulty is though that we need a larger inventory to be able to accommodate that. Uh, demand varies from year to year. It varies according to uh, the state of the economy. It also varies according to geography. So the intent is for the plan was to identify a number of different sites that would be able to meet that, uh, that variable demand. So we're looking at uh, several different sites for several different industries. In, in summary, uh, we would be in relatively good shape if we had about 500 acres of available land. Uh, we'd be in really good shape and competitive with our peer cities if we had a thousand acres and we're significantly short of that at this point in time. Um, we did a, an analysis of land within the city that might be suitable. Um, this map illustrates those areas that uh, have some capacity for industrial and we, we looked at proximity to um, freeways, railroad, employment centers and other um, uh, infrastructure that supports the development of industrial land. Uh, we then, or the consultants then narrowed that down to four or 16 selected sites that 
we felt that we could focus on, and those are then those are the basis of the amendment that we have before you today. Even in the time since the report was adopted, a couple of these areas have been further compromised. Uh, we've lost Site 16, which is the one in the middle, and then a couple of the others have had to have their boundaries modified because of uh, rezonings. So this is the new comprehensive plan map. These areas will be denoted, denoted as an employment reserve. We used to have a protected industrial area there. Um, that is, uh, there's only one small site there. We had an industrial reserve and that uh, category has been removed. So these areas are now designated in the plan and the policies that we're looking to, to use to protect those areas um, uh, are, are captured in these particular actions that we're taking here. So those will be designated for large-scale employment. Uh, we will permit some commercial and other use in those areas if it supports the major employment use and doesn't impair that capacity for that site to be able to service large industrial. So for that same reason, we will be prohibiting single family, mobile homes, schools, those will not be permitted in the area because those are not servicing those large uh, employment areas. And then we're also looking at the context as well, so we're, we're asking that if anybody is doing development adjacent to those sites, that they, uh, and that use is not permitted within the industrial reserve area, it may be permitted in a planned unit development if there are certain controls, so we would negotiate that. So the intent is to ensure that we're not um, ending up in a situation where we've got a conflict with the primary use of those areas. So as I said, this is an interim, uh, interim approach with the amendment to the comprehensive plan, and um, be happy to answer any questions. I, this was probably pointed out, and I guess I'm a little unclear. So we're working on the plan. It's a, you know, at least a two-year process in getting the plan. Um, the pl yeah. plan will probably be early 14. Okay. And so what's the specific need for doing this resolution to, do, to amending this, this plan in, in the interim before we get that one? We need to, we need to provide a, uh, a, a greater level of protection for these sites. Uh, as I mentioned, some of the sites have already been uh, compromised and, and removed. So if we don't act now, then there's a chance that uh, more of these sites will be, um, will be diminished yeah. and will lose their value. Okay. No, that's a... It's a great answer. Yeah, I, Russell, I, I really I hadn't thought of that necessarily. Really appreciate, you know, putting in some specific teeth, if you will, to this. Uh, Ward six was responsible for diminishing two of those sites: <laughs> one with the development of Aztec School, and the other, the Northcare site across from it. Both of which are fabulous developments, but it was a pretty special um, piece of property. So I, I'm very grateful for being able to, you know, communicate more clearly to those that might want to develop something, how they could work within the framework. And, and as we're negotiating with the other departments for the development of the plan, we're talking about how to get that infrastructure uh, directed towards these areas so that we can have more employment land available. Okay. Your Honor, yeah, Your Honor, <clears throat> I, I uh, think it's tremendously important that we uh, move forward with this plan. Uh, this really helps separates us from the surrounding communities to be able to offer 500 to 1,000 acres of industrial uh, area. Most smaller communities just don't have that capability. We need these basic manufacturing industrial type employers to come here to Oklahoma City to provide the jobs and workforce that allows the city to continue to grow. Uh, it's it's I think it's the basis then that allows us to support that with uh, retail and other uh, types of development that then generates revenues for the city. But I think it's critical. And Russell, do we uh, have plans to work or possibly try to develop a, some kind of a partnership? There are large industrial developers just like there are large retail developers throughout the country that specialize in developing areas that are designed specific, specifically for industrial and manufacturing type use. Maybe in conjunction with the Oklahoma City Chamber, we could reach out and try to identify those potential partners 
and work with some type of a partnership to encourage that type of development. You would think with a city of 622 miles, we could identify 500 to 1,000 uh, acres in one location to provide that. You'd think so. Um, it, <laughs> It, well, it, I, I, it's I, interesting because those, those study areas we have only, only equate to about 6,300 acres, um, which is about 1.6 percent of the, of the city area. So it looks like we have a lot of land, but not a lot of it is actually capable of being assembled into these large employment areas. And, and just one other point, sorry, Councilman. Well, I know where our 640-acre tract is that, that is totally under one ownership. It's served by all the things we're talking about. I, I have a question. I mean, I'm not arguing we shouldn't do this, but I know where a 601 square mile is in my ward that has one owner. Uh, it's served by Interstate 40 and served by rail and served by water and served by sewer. Uh, I'm assuming that's I, not I'm your one, property. I have, I, I'd like to understand a little bit more about the background that that how is you get in and what puts you in and what takes you out yeah that that is one of the properties um, that's the school land site i presume you're talking about well the tract i'm talking about was recently rezoned overlaid rezoned at the request of the chamber to preserve it correct and now i'm hearing that we don't have one place where there's 500 acres well we do but it's not development ready that particular site has approximately 220 easements that are complicating that site so it is a high priority and negotiations have begun with with school lands authority but it is going to take some time to sort out that site so that it's development ready that's going to be true of any site well, it, maybe, it is. I mean, that's that many because that's right in the middle of the old Oklahoma City oil field, and that is that right. probably going to have more of those kind of easement problems. But I, I think you're, the the problem the the problem isn't stated properly. I mean, I, it seems to me to say we don't have any places. We do have places. They may not be development ready yet, but this is not going to make them development ready. What's going to make them development ready is getting in and hiring a land use lawyer and vacating all those right. easements. Right. And that's, that's part of that conversation with school lands, is to begin that process, and it is going to take time. But There's that, another quarter section of school land at I-40 I forty and Choctaw Road. Now, it's not served by water and sewer, right. but it's a 100 and, well, it's six, it's not, it's, I, think it's, I think it's a quarter. It's 160 acres. But... Uh, there's land all along I-40 that's served by rail also, north right. of I-40. Right. Um, it would seem to me, rather than doing this, we ought to be emphasizing cleaning up the titles. Well, that, that's, that is part of the game plan. There's another school land site over um, west, northwest of Tinker as well right. that is included in this. Right. It's a quarter section. And those are, those are, there are three pretty good sized tracks. Right. I mean, they're just those, it, um, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd just like to see, as it, my, as it affects my ward, I'd like to see what tracks we're talking about and what the land use change is going to be along 240. Because there are acres, that, the Water Trust owns land along 240 on the, on the south edge of it uh, that could be utilized. I, I just, I'd like to know a little bit more about it. We'd be, we'd be happy to talk to you about that. I mean, part of this, you know, the ongoing conversation, this is one piece of the implementation of the plan, is to provide this interim protection until we get it, it officially recognized in the completed comprehensive plan. But we are meeting on an ongoing basis, the city, uh, the Alliance for Economic Development, and the chamber to uh, look at those action steps, the other steps outside of the city's authority to be able to implement the plan. And some of that requires, is going to require assemblage of land. Um, so I don't think any of these, I don't know if any of these sites individually are, are ready to go right now. They all need something. So it's a matter of determining, and there are priorities identified in the plan as to which ones would be easier to move with. The school, the school land site, the, the whole section, um, is identified as a high priority because it has limited ownership. It only has one owner. Some other sites have up to 32 owners. Right. 
but one owner, except you have all those other encumbrances on the property, there are new rigs that are still being drilled on that site, so it's going to take some time to sort out, and it will probably be piecemeal and that you'll get part of it that would be made available, um, and then you just have to keep working on the rest of it. Well, it's probably got 100 abandoned uh, uh, pipeline easements right, across yeah, that quarter. Yeah. Um, of course, that's Yeah, it's perfect. a lot of title work. But it would seem to me concentrating on getting them ready as opposed to going out looking for more. Well, well we're not, they're not I'm interested in doing something no. rather than talking about it. Well, the, the, you know, the point of the plan was to identify which ones are out there. It's not, to, it's not really to look for more. I mean, to, to assemble. If we're going to go out, uh, if we go beyond these, if, if these were all unable to be developed, then we would have to go out and look for more, which would require a lot more effort in assembling those properties. So they would be more complicated. Ed, can we just, it's a tangent, but big stuff on tornadoes. Are we going to, I've seen things on the internet that try and map out where tornadoes are going. Can, are we going to get, as the task force or something else, an official kind of outline of where the tornado, because you mentioned I-40 and Choctaw Road. I mean, that, that has been hit over and over and over. Hmm. And I, will there be, is there a way to get an official mapping of where all the tornadoes have, have hit through the city? I'm sure we could. I've seen that as well. I don't know who produced it. I've, I've seen it also. Okay. Frank right there produced it. <laughs> Frank, okay. Frank can, you get a, can you get Councilman Shadid a, a copy of that? Yeah. And the rest of the council as well. All right. Thank you. I had a question, Larry? Your Honor. Uh, okay. On Pete's comment that a lot of this is old oil field, the pipeline easements certainly are an impediment, but how about the rights of the mineral owners? Can the city condemn mineral owner rights and acquire them like they can land? So the, the mineral owners will have some say what goes in there. Uh, yeah. Larry? In Oklahoma, they probably have more say in the surface owner does. Thank you. Russell, will, will, this, will this help us uh, turn uh, three sites uh, that are underutilized right now into profitable industrial sites? And the sites that I'm talking about are the Lucent Technology site, which is underutilized, the Corning site, which uh, is, is underutilized, and the Xerox site, which is underutilized, and each one of those is currently zoned, correctly if I'm wrong, for industrial purposes. Correct. Will this help us uh, it, it, convert those? Well, it, it does. Yeah, I mean, the policies are supportive. I mean, what, it's, what we haven't really articulated that strongly before is the importance of these sites for building the economy of Oklahoma City. So that's why we're adding these additional layers of protection. So those existing sites already have value because they've already serviced. But yet, uh, this, uh, as we move forward, will we still face the challenge that we faced with the Bridgestone Firestone site, where Bridgestone Firestone, uh, for those that maybe have forgotten it, donated X number of acres right. of their prime industrial property to uh, the Western Heights School District under the stipulation that it had to be used for a school. And the school district wanted to build a school, and the, the zoning people and the Chamber of Commerce were definitely opposed to this. Uh, the neighbors of Western Heights all passed a bond issue to fund the school before the final zoning decision was made, and it created somewhat of a, a dilemma. It was a dilemma. Well, we have a lot to keep going to. So, mm -hmm. Russell, thank, thank you. you. We're going we're gonna to move forward. Do we need a motion to pass 8L? Yeah. Okay. okay. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. <laughs> Item 8M uh, will ratify the emergency declaration the city manager made uh, last week in the, in the wake of the storms. Yeah. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. And I just want to thank Wiley Williams. He put that together very, very quickly uh, uh, Monday afternoon, and I think it was uh, emailed to council about 6, 37 o'clock that afternoon. So thanks to the Mr. Council's office. Item 8N. I understand we do not need executive session on this item. We have a motion. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 8O. I understand we do not need executive session. Do not. Have a motion. And a second. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 8P, I understand we do not need executive session. Okay. Second. Item is struck. Item 8Q is claims recommended for denial. Is there anyone here wishing to speak under any item listed under 8Q, claims recommended for denial? All right, how about a motion? Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. 
Item 9 is the claim recommended for approval. Is there anyone here wishing to speak on the item 9A1A, claim recommended for approval? All right, how about a motion? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 10 is items from council, and uh, Councilwoman Sawyer has uh, an idea about uh, creating the quiet zone that's been much discussed. you want to present that? And I'll go ahead, Mayor, and then I think we've got some folks here that probably have signed up to speak. Um, predating my election to the City Council, constituents of Ward 6 brought forward the concept of a quiet zone along the railroad corridor uh, between Northeast 16th Street and Northeast 7th Street to the city staff. Uh, Burlington, Northern Railroad Santa Fe, Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad has subsequently requested that we extend that closure portion down to Southeast 23rd Street. As the memorandum before you details, on March 3rd of 2009, the council approved a resolution directing the staff to investigate the viability of creating the corridor. Today before you is a two-phase funding plan for the realization of the quiet zone. As stated in the memo, it's my recommendation that in place of using general fund dollars, that we match the substantial private dollars that have been raised with the excess fund balance dollars that are presumed to be allocated to Ward 6 in the proposed 2013-2014 budget, along with an allocation of TIF dollars so that we can move these improvements forward. As is widely known, and as I have previously stated in front of this body, I am a property owner in my ward, primarily along Broadway. As such, and to avoid any possible perception of a conflict of interest today, I'm going to recuse myself from the vote on this matter. I do, however, want to thank all of the folks that are here to speak on behalf. Mickey Clegg and Steve Mason have um, worked tirelessly uh, with the community um, to bring a sub very substantial private contribution before the city today. And so I'd like to thank them for their great concern for the commitment they have to our community. Your Honor, I'd like to make a comment. When this idea was first floated through the council, I was opposed to it because the property owners out there had no money in the game, in the game. They're all going to fight, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Not from Oklahoma, so I can't. Uh, but anyway, uh, they, they've come to the table with a substantial contribution to this. And because of that, I have no objections. I think it's a good project to improve the safety and the, the uh, of our citizens, in addition to providing an environment without the noise of the train blowing and whistle throughout. Mayor, we do have some presentations here this morning. Uh, as as Eric Winger is going to spell out the specifics of what is a, a, a quiet zone and, and what it involves. Uh, Kathy O'Connor is here to, to talk about the funding plan to accomplish it. And then Mickey Clegg is here to, to uh, represent uh, the, what the private donations have, have been uh, toward this end. Okay. Do you, council want to speak before this? Larry, do you want to say something? Yeah. Just uh, to uh, go on what, what Pat said, um, the folks in my ward uh, have uh, steadfastly talked about the fact that we spend so much time emphasizing downtown. And this is a, quote, downtown-oriented project. However, the use of general funds uh, that might be available from our fund balance, where each uh, councilman may have the discretion at that time to use his a portion of funds for projects in his area, uh, really appeals to me. And so therefore, I'm in favor of this uh, with the financing program that's going to be outlined, because in my ward, uh, that money that w would be available will be used to uh, handle arterial streets which need repaving. And Eric's up here. He knows we have a number of streets in Ward 3 that need repaving. So uh, I'm excited about the potential. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh -huh. Yeah, Pete? Uh, you know, for just the, I, I feel just the opposite. The idea that we should port barrel out a million dollars to each council member and let us decide goes totally against the grain, in my view, of how we ought to handle the city's net needs and its priorities. Yeah. When I came on the council, that's the way it worked. And for, for about eight years, we fought that very thing till we, got, till we got to the point where we didn't do that anymore. We got to the point where we did like we did sidewalks. We parceled them out based on the need. We started doing roads based on the need. Now we are, now here we are back to a situation where we're going to pork it out. Each one of us, if we have a pet project, we can do it ourselves. I don't, I don't like that. I don't think that's what we're sent here to do. 
And especially I don't think it's sent here to do because I don't understand where, how you get to $4 million in this thing. It seems to me there's got to be, I'd like to know exactly where the money's coming from in each case. The fact that people's enlightened self-interest are, are, are in such a way that they're willing to put one-eighth of the, of the money in because of their enlightened self-interest, I would hope they have the same enlightened self-interest when it comes to paying for this trolley idea because that's going to raise property values there too. I, I, I just, I, I think that we're, this is the wrong path to go down. Um, I, I, uh, I, would have, I would have argued against the canal, great success that it's been, but had I been here, I would have argued against it because the people didn't put any money in. At least now we're, we're getting people to put an eighth of the money up. Is that if a half a million out of 400,000, that's eight, right? I mean, out of four, yeah, four yeah, million, four million, a half a million out of four is an eighth. Yeah, actually, they're putting more than that, but that's... You're well, not well, that's what this says, a half a million. Yeah, they, they've got more, a little bit more has come in. Okay. I, I just, I just not, I'm just not sure that's the way that the government ought to be spending its money. I think establishing what our priorities are and spending that money citywide based on those priorities is a much more equitable and much more democratic with a small d way of, of allocating funds. I just don't think that's a good way to do it. Um, it benefits one little strip, and it's going to make a lot of money for people that own property up and down that strip. Development's going to jump there. But, and we're going to take money collected from all the citizens of the city and do that. And we've done it over and over and over. That's the big complaint I hear in my word about what's wrong with the whole MAPS project, is we don't, we didn't spread it out enough. And I voted for it every time. I, I, I stand guilty. But I, as I look at it, the projects could have been spread out a little bit more. And this is just another example of, of just, we, we're just, we just have this ton of vision about what's important. And we're leaving out 90% of the citizens of the, of the city. I just can't, I mean, I lived by the railroad track as a kid growing up, and that didn't bother me, you know. I grew up with it, had a window open because we didn't have an air conditioner. I can tell you when the Santa Fe train would come through at about 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, it just, I just think it's, if you look at things we need to be doing, sidewalks that need to be built, uh, parks that need to be upgraded, the idea that we'd drop $4 million into this, actually BNSF is coming up with half of it, so we'd, we'd drop $2 million into it. it. To me, it just sends the wrong message, but I'm gonna, I hope it's not a test of fellowship for my other friends here, because I'm going to be here next Tuesday, no matter which way it goes. But right, Any other comments before we hear from Eric? Okay, Eric, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor and Council. It's been a number of years since we've talked about the quiet zone, so we thought it'd be important this morning to kind of review the history and to go through some of the steps that have already been taken, some of the studies and some of the preliminary work that's already been done. Um, again, as was mentioned um, by Meg and what's also included in your council memo, um, this actually began in March of 2009 when the City Council provided some direction to City staff to do some of those preliminary studies. Um, when, we look at, uh, when we look at the quiet zone, again, we're looking at an area that's bound by Northeast 7th to Northeast 16th primarily. I'm going to expand that here in just a minute a little bit as we have worked with BNSF. They wish to expand it a little bit further. Uh, but again, um, there are crossing upgrades, um, and the, one of the primary goals, of course, is to reduce the number of, of horn blows that the train engineers are required to do at those intersections. And so a lot ask, why a quiet zone? And so there, there are actually several, there are several factors. The reduced horns is one of those, but obviously it does encourage economic redevelopment, aesthetics, it improves safety. Um, that's obviously an advantage to both the city and BNSF. Um, it upgrades the constant uh, warning signals at the, at the crossings. Um, and then, of course, uh, safety corridors is where BNSF is, is most interested in creating these. Um, obviously a goal that is, is both a railroad goal and a city goal. When we look at the project area and the purpose, uh, this is an aerial photograph um, here. You'll see 7th Street on the left side. Um, you'll see 16th Street on the right side. There are a number of crossings as we look at the railroad as it crosses north to south in downtown Oklahoma City. Um, there is some additional crossings that are, being in, that are of interest. Southeast 25th Street, which was mentioned. 
Um, again, is one of the first service crossings. 23rd is one that is currently under construction. But the next service crossing doesn't occur clear up until Wilshire Boulevard. And so there is actually an opportunity, as we've explored and studied this process, that the quiet zone could actually expand outside of the area, just shown here in downtown. It could extend up to Wilshire and as far south as Southeast 25th Street. There's a number of phases. Eric, it, it could expand or it will? I mean, will it go from 25th to Wilshire or it could go? It could. So we are still in the conceptual phase, um, which there is still a lot ahead of us as we look at design, construction, and the actual formal creation of the quiet zone. If all of the construction, I should back up. So at the end of this presentation, you're going to see some next steps. One of the very first steps is approving of the funding plan, which is what you're being asked to do today. That is a part of the conceptual. If funding is provided, then we can proceed into design, construction, and then applications could be made to the Federal Rail Association um, to actually create the actual quiet zone itself. So we're still really in, in phase one of the overall process, but the potential is there. It could go from Wilshire to Southeast 25th Street. Okay. Eric, excuse me, but if you did extend it down to Southeast 25th Street, that would require the closing of 25th Street. Is that true? Just The closing uh, of 23rd. Of 23rd Street, uh, just east of Shields Boulevard. Yes, it would. And so that is one of the items that has come up with discussions with the railroad. 23rd is, is a difficult crossing. The way that the grades work there, there are a lot of vehicles, especially those that have low boy type trailers that do get stuck under the tracks. Um, they, they drag as they, they crest and go over that, that passing. BNSF would like to see the city close that as a part of the quiet zone proposal. More so from a safety concern. Absolutely, yes as opposed to a noise issue? Yes, it's a safety concern from the railroad's perspective. Okay, thank you. So when we look at the process, we're still on the phase one. We're in this conceptual portion of the quiet zone. Um, design, um, construction have yet to follow. Um, so on the, we go to the next slide. These are the steps of the conceptual design. Notice of intent of required parties, public meetings. There has to be a concept finalization. And then, of course, the negotiation of an agreement between the city and the railroad. We've done these to the level of preliminary meetings have been held. There have been a number of public meetings already held. Um, this was a number of years ago. But, uh, but when we look at those, um, you'll find that we actually had a planning commission meeting in December of 2009. The Automobile Alley Association met in October of 2010 and again in March of 2012. And of course, the Downtown Design Review Committee met in January of 2011. But nothing proceeded at that time. And so we would expect that with the, with the time that's expent that there would be additional public meetings um, required. The design itself is not complete and again the agreement itself is not complete as well. So that's where we are today. Excuse me Eric, I, I would like uh, eventually for you all to look um, past Wilshire uh, to a little bit past uh, 122nd um, because those people here, those train uh, the, the, the choo-choo uh, as well. Uh, and they hear it all throughout the nights and, and, and days. I, we can consider that, absolutely. If we look at the next phase, the design phase, there's two components of the design. There's the railroad portion of the improvements and then there's the city portion of the improvements. The railroad is not going to allow the city to work on the tracks, to work on the crossing guards, the arms, the things that go with the railroad. The only portion that the city would be able to do is the approaches and the areas outside of the railroad. So as we rebuild roadways, as we look at those, so it's very much of a joint effort. There is a railroad design that would need to take place. There's also roadway plans that will have to be repaired by the city of Oklahoma City. So we move into construction. The same is true. The railroad must construct their improvements. The city would construct theirs. But it would be a coordinated effort. And obviously we're looking at a number of intersections that would be, be affected. And then the creation of the quiet zone. So once all of the agreements are in place, there is actually a review. There's an application made to the Federal Rail Association. Um, they look at the risk calculations, the traffic counts, there's the review process, and then there's finally the notice of the creation of the actual quiet zone itself. So again, as I, as I mentioned, we're really in step one or in phase one of a four-phase process. And so conceptual work has been completed, but we're not nearly into the design or the construction phases at this point. When we look at the proposal, and we're looking at that area that's uh, being studied very, very closely, 6th Street to 16th Street, you'll see here a list of the proposed improvements at each of those intersections. 
And they're going to fall into three categories. If you look at 16th Street, you'll see that there'll be the addition of medians. If you look at 15th and others, you're going to see there's some closures being proposed. Um, you'll also look at quad gates, which I'll show you here in just a moment at a couple of the crossings, like at 10th Street. So each intersection would be reviewed independently for the level of which it would meet the quiet zone. There's actually, as a part of the review, a points-based system that the railroad looks at to see if the quiet zone qualifies or not. Next slide. If we look at the medians example, as you'll picture these intersections, and I use these just as examples, there are really just three ways to improve intersections to make them more safe. You either add medians. Now what the medians do is if you can picture the two signal arms that would normally come down, there are those that feel that they can beat the train. They will actually drive across into opposing traffic and weave their way through the two arms. But if we add medians to the streets, they would then have to jump a curb to even make that possible. And so medians is one way of increasing the safety with single arm intersections. The next example is quad gates. Where medians aren't possible, you actually have arms that lower from both directions, thus blocking road traffic completely. They're, they would have to crash through the gate would be the only way for them to go through the intersection. And then the last example would be an actual closing of the crossing. We have a number of locations, either due to development or just due to other low traffic volumes. It is possible that we could actually close a few of those intersections and create new cul-de-sacs to actually have those cars be able to circulate on those existing streets. So as we get ready to, to talk about the funding proposal, you know, the, one of the items, and I'm, I'm going to turn over the funding to uh, Ms. O'Connor here in just a moment, but the, the estimated cost of the quiet zone um, after visiting and working with an engineer um, is $3.9 million. And it would be accomplished in a couple of phases. If you look at the phase one at $2.9 million and the phase two at $1 million, the real difference there is that the city would be phasing its construction over two major parts. One would be we would work with the railroad very, very closely to accomplish their work, the work that would be required of the railroad. We would do minimal street improvements at that point. Phase two would be to complete the final street improvements with the addition of curb, gutter, sidewalks, you know, any of the other more permanent type of improvements. Um, but, uh, but with that, there's a, there's a funding plan that uh, I'm going to allow Kathy to speak to. And uh, again, I can answer any questions as we finish the presentation. Thank you. As, um, as Eric mentioned, the total project cost for this project is $3.9 million, and it's broken into two phases. Um, what I'd like to ask you to do is to turn to attachment B that's um, included with your council item. It has a more detailed um, table that shows the costs and the funding sources associated with both phases of this project. Phase one includes uh, $1,720,000 from the Downtown Tax Increment Financing District as a proposed funding source. $185,000 from the OCMFA, which is proposed to fund the, the architectural and engineering services associated with the project. There's also $500,000 identified from the general fund that we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, and another $500,000 from private sources. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out is that by funding phase one, the, the quiet zone can be created. Phase two provides for more permanent improvements, such as cul de sac some of the streets that are closed. So with the funding approval for phase one, we can create the quiet zone from 16th Street down to Southeast 25th. As is stated in the council memo, um, it's anticipated that there will be excess general fund fund balance available again this year. And that in the past, that money has been allocated among the different wards, and each ward has been able to determine how they would like to allocate their portion of that funding. As is stated in the memo, Councilwoman Salyer would like to use a portion of her funding to go towards the phase one quiet zone. Um, so the, and you've already discussed some of that and know that that's a part of the funding plan. Phase two funding has also been shown on attachment B, but again, it's really um, an illustration of what the funding for phase two could look like, and the funding does include an additional allocation of tax increment financing dollars to complete the project. Um, but it could be funded from other sources if the council determined that at a later date, such as a future bond issue, um, general fund funding, uh, funding from the other capital improvement funding sources. 
With that, I'd like to introduce um, Mickey Clegg, who would like to talk a little bit about the private donations that have been raised for this project. Um, we had an original goal of trying to raise $500,000 to help uh, demonstrate the private commitment to this project, and I think Mickey has some good results to report. Thank you, Kathy. I'd like to hand this out if I can, and this is a list that I'll talk about. Uh, I'm here uh, representing Automobile Alley, and if you'll note, uh, Automobile Alley is the first on the list. I have these listed um, by um, the amount of the contribution. Automobile Alley obviously is uh, most affected by this. It's a bid district, a historic Automobile Alley, uh, $100,000, and they're going to pay that out over uh, the balance of their bid um, year, which I think is seven years. Um, and then some of these, most of these, are paid out of our three-year commitment, with the first payment being January 1st of this year, of next year, and then each uh, annual um, anniversary date. Uh, Delisi, um, which obviously owns a lot of property at 13th and uh, along the railroad tracks. Midtown Renaissance, another company that I represent, and also Mercedes-Benz of Oklahoma City. Downtown OKC, 40,000. Uh, uh, Newmark Grub Levy. Strange and Beffert, uh, 36,000. The Medical Business District, which um, is another um, organization that uh, I'm a member of, uh, they are, um, the Medical Business District is the uh, corridor along 10th Street between uh, OU and St. Anthony's. Now, on, also on the right, full, full disclosure, the X's mean that I have a signed commitment from them that I've got here today. The, the one, Heritage Hills, I don't have that. However, that their board has approved that. I just haven't got their document yet. Uh, and then you can kind of go down the list. Also, I'd like to point out OU Health Sciences Center, uh, $20,000. St. Luke's Methodist Church, $20,000. Um, Oklahoma Contemporary, who's building their new museum along the railroad track, $15,000. And also, I'd like to point out the YMCA, which is uh, right along the railroad track, which are uh, very much affected by that. So you can see there are 28 names on here. I have signed commitments from uh, 23, but the total is $668,700. Any questions? Any well, questions? Thank you for your effort. Thank you. And congratulations on how the Midtown area has changed over the last several years through your efforts and a lot of private enterprises going in there. It's been really amazing to watch it grow. Thank you very much. Can I clarify a couple of things with Kathy on the funding plan as we go forward? Just just one clarification. Can we get that last graph? Yeah, JC, can you go back to that last funding plan that's up there? TIF $2 can only be used in, in, in the TIF 2 area. Right. And if so you look at the that funding plan way. that's attached to your agenda item, it'll show you where some of the funding is going to be spent in the TIF district and some of it will be spent outside the TIF district. That's because the funding allocated from the downtown TIF district can only be spent south of 13th Street and north of the old I-40, but um, for this purpose, south of 13th Street. And OCM, OC MFA dollars, those were for the engineering dollars and that's already uh, yes. been spent. That was what I, was I done in 09 when, when that was spent. Right. Yeah, that has already been expended to do the preliminary engineering work that's been done up to this point. And the general fund that's designated has now been identified if the council goes forward with, with the allocation. And that's an if at this point in time. would only, could only be spent in, in, in the Ward right. 6 area. Yes. And the private donations that, that are that now total $668,000 could only be, would not be there if that was to be spent elsewhere. So right. not all of the funds, but a good part of the funds could only be spent in this general. In this area. Yep. They couldn't be transferred to a different different part. I just wanted, wanted to clarify that, po that mm -hmm. point. And then also, um, there's been, the, the, the official beginning of this by the city was in 09 when we did the engineering study that was, we funded the engineering study on that. Right. But there's been discussion about a quiet zone for, for many years be, beyond that. I know that you've been, approached by a number of organizations over the years. Developers have come in. As a matter of fact, there's actually a, 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 a development that did not come to fruition 
but they were going to allocate their portion of their TIF dollars to, to, to the quiet zone. And so discussions about a quiet zone have been going on for, for, for many years beyond that, maybe up to up to 10 years or so. Yeah, so would, yeah it's been at least seven or eight years now. Yeah. And what, what is the BNSF contribution? You said there's $2 million from BNSF. What? If, let's go back one more slide, JC. If you look at the project cost details, the two million is what BNSF is actually we would pay as a city to actually have the work accomplished for the crossing guards, either the quad gates, um, the median construction, and all of those things. What I would mention to you about BNSF is when we were working with them a number of years ago, that estimate was in the two and a half million range. Um, when construction costs increased, it got as high as two point nine million dollars. But in some of the conversations we've had with them over the past six months about seeing some of the costs come back in line, we're down to a number that's now two million. And so their costs have fluctuated, but they're just as interested, I think, in moving this forward from a safety perspective. They've now given us a number that's that's two million dollars to do that work. Are they making actual investments or are they just they're lowering the cost of they're lowering the cost in anticipation that they can uh, they can accomplish it at a at a reduced rate using their own labor. So their contribution is, is their management and, and, and efficiencies in their operations and lowering that number as, as low as it is today. But it still is a cost of the city pays. So one of the very first expenses that the city would expense if approved would be approximately $2 million to BNSF to start changing over those crossings. But they need to do the design before they can do the construction. And so if we look at this last slide, I mean, there's still quite a bit that needs to be done. Obviously, today is the funding proposal. There's most necessary probably a few additional public meetings to make sure that we brought everybody up to speed. But the preliminary report that was mentioned, the one that actually did the initial studies, has not been presented to the city council because at the time the cost was excessive. That was when BNSF had a cost that was somewhere between 2.5 and 2.9 million dollars just for their portion of the work. And we did not have a funding plan in place. But uh, with finalizing the funding, securing the private donations that you've heard about today, we can then enter into that design phase the construction and then the creation of the quiet zone. I guess I, I'm, I apologize. I just can't keep up with the, I don't understand. I thought it, it went to 25th to Wilshire, so I'm still having trouble getting my arms around that. Is, what we're doing today only guarantees this 12 block area? That is what the funding plan predominantly provides for, yes. But at 23rd Street, the railroad is very interested in closing 23rd Street at minimal cost to the city. It's the next at-grade crossing south of downtown. If that crossing is closed to the south, the quiet zone could perhaps be all the way to southeast 25th. It, so, what if John brought up Ward 7. What if John's willing to put fund balance into going up to? I think that Ward? there's some opportunities. We haven't, we haven't studied those with a railroad yet. But again, the next at-grade crossing to the north is Wilshire Boulevard. So perhaps as we continue to finalize this, we could extend it further as the railroad and funds become available. But I, honestly, we've only focused on this area with the railroad over the past few years. We could open up that conversation. Because of the fact that there is a, a large area that's already uh, protected, if you will, between 16th and, and, and Wilshire, that's already essentially a quiet zone in there just because of, of, of the uh, sub great separated crossings that exist in that area. So by doing this, this central core area and, and, and hitting it down, you, you essentially get the 25th to Wilshire area will all be a, a, essentially a, a quiet zone. And we're saying that just because there's a, there's a large area that, that presently exists and you're just adding to that. Uh, when you go to the north, uh, you've got crossings at, at, at Wilshire, you've got crossings at, at uh, uh, cert certainly at, at uh, Britain, Hefner, 122nd, Memorial, so uh, uh, Kelly. There's, there's a number of, of them up there, so it's, it, 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 right. it, where, where by doing this se segment, you, you, you get a, a pretty significant benefit by that. Okay. Eric, are you through with the presentation? I am. Can, All right. Any questions can... for Eric before we let him go? All right. Thank you. Um, Steve Mason has uh, signed up to speak, and there may be others, but Steve has uh, filled out the form. My name is Steve Mason. I'm the chairman of the Downtown Business Improvement District, a volunteer, and speaking on behalf of the Business Improvement District and also a property owner in the 9th and Broadway area, we would appreciate your support of this and the benefits to this community stretching from the river past Heritage Hills up to 36th are very strong. Thank you.
Okay. Well, we have a resolution on the table. Um, we'll need someone to make a motion on, on this area. And this, this uh, would approve the funding plan which has been presented to us. I, did, I just want to address what, what Pete said and just, I, I would echo Pete's concerns about the pork barrel nature of, and if, if we get five, I'm voting with you. I mean, if, you, if, we, if we can get the votes to change it, I mean, as long as it stays like this, um, I, I would hope that this would be the death knell of that the, it has to be spent on paving streets. I mean, this really, to me, represents a policy change that streets now is a, a much broader definition than simply the pavement where the cars travel. It's for whatever the street needs. Um, in Ward 2, for example, I mean, this, the buses that travel down Ward 2 have a hard time interfacing with the transit riders. And so bus shelters would, in my mind, would be one of the, the most pressing needs. Uh, uh, and so I, I would hope that, I guess we're in agreement that we're moving as a policy away from where we were a couple of years ago that we were strictly going to spend fund balance on street pay. I think we're open-minded on it. And since I'm not part of that eight, I, I try to keep an eye on everything that, that, that goes forward with this. But I would say as far as this funding plan, to me this seems the result of council, of council interaction and opinions that have been presented. And so I don't want it to be construed as, 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 as outside of that. I mean, I think, I think this, is the, this is kind of the result of a lot of different input and opinions. Uh, that has taken place. I, I think if you if you could extend it wider, you'd alleviate some of Pete's concerns, maybe about it just being confined to one area of the city. And I think Pete brought up a really good point in that if you look at the first couple of slides about the economic benefits of this, you can apply every single one of those to the streetcar. And so if if almost every city in America, or I'm not aware of any that don't, the property owners are doing something similar. In, in terms of streetcar operations and maintenance, I think we're going to have to come back and revisit uh, later uh, some of the same arguments. And if, the, if you know, and maybe as as Pat at Pat stated, what makes it more palatable is that they have skin in the game or that they have an investment. And if they're not willing to invest in the streetcar, I think that raises some questions. Thanks. Okay. Here, the yeah, the, uh, the five hundred thousand of the general fund is that fun, is that available funds, or is that future funds? What we've historically done is, is at the end, of the end of the year, we've taken a look at what our, our fund balance is, what we have, and we have a policy to keep our, our, our fund balance between 9 and 15 um, it, percent. It's, it's very likely we'll be over that as we close out the year, and so because of that, in the past couple of years, we, we have allocated that money, and, and you know, it's $8 million, which would be 2 percent of our fund balance, uh, to street projects and, and it has been broadened from time to time beyond the street projects but and have have uh, the last few years uh, divided that equally per ward so it's not going to be part of the upcoming budget it's, it is it's not the, it is not in the budget the budget that we're in right now is presented to you that's correct sir okay that, that right. it, it seemed like how we were talking it was out of order and so David and then Pat thank you Honor. Um, I'd like to address Pete's and Ed's comments about uh, the concern over breaking up uh, by ward monies that we have a have the ability to use. One, it's only on surplus funds. It's not like we get to divvy up, uh, you know, from our general fund uh, at the beginning of the budget year. It's only if we do meet a uh, situation where we have surplus funds, can it be allocated among the wards? And if you think in terms of eight million dollars compared to one billion dollars. It's a very, very, very small percentage. Pete's comments, I mean, I agree with everything that's been said. I really do. I just wanted to share a different perspective on that. I don't think we need to try to get into uh, pork barreling or, you know, one ward having a greater influence over the other. But on the other hand, if I identify an area or a a, an issue in Ward 5, for example, I may not be able to uh, explain it as well as, say, Pete does with respect to a concern he has for Ward 5, I mean for Ward 4, so at least I know we've got about a million, based upon recent history, that I can designate to an area that I think really is uh, an important issue for Ward 5, even though staff hasn't included it 
in a uh, overall uh, plan for improvements, whether it's streets or sidewalks or some other area. So I do like the ability, when we do have a surplus, to be able to identify something within our each particular ward to focus on. Uh, and I, I, again, agree with Pete. I don't want us to get into a point where we're actually making a larger percentage of our budget kind of pork barreling to each ward. I think we've got to look at the city as a whole. But in this instance, and if this is what Councilwoman Salyer would like to designate her surplus for, it's hard for me to argue against that, especially when we bring into the issue uh, improved safety for all people who happen to travel down these roads. And Eric, I assume those crossing arms, uh, the, the maintenance of those, that's the responsibility of the railroads, not the city. So we're putting more responsibility on the safety uh, back towards the railroad. And the fact that a horn, a train blows its horn, I don't think that's going to diminish a person trying to weave their way through these arms in the current scenario. Uh, but if it actually blocks them from being able to do that and, and improve safety, then uh, uh, I feel inclined to uh, agree with this proposal. Yeah. Pat? No, thank you. I just wanted to comment. I uh, felt myself agreeing with Mr. White, but he talked long enough to convince me I shouldn't agree with him. <laughs> <laughs> I do think it's important that we not divide this thing up politically. And I know uh, when Ward 8 considered some spending that money a year ago, we got a list of projects from the the Public Works Department that they felt were important. And we had some input in choosing which ones we wanted to do. So it wasn't just I'm going out and pick out a street because I like it. I think we need to be aware that that is a very slippery slope to get down. Yeah. And I think we need to rely on our, our experts who identify problems that exist and let us try to solve those as best we can, rather than go out and try to, to make somebody happy just because we pave a street in front of their house. And those all come back to council for approval before they go out. So, so if there's a project that would seem to be inappropriate to, 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 to be used, it does come back to the council for their approval. Is there? Two, two brief comments. One, uh, when we had that additional funds uh, in the past, that's exactly what we did in Ward uh, 3. We got with Public Works. They had ratings on the street. Every street is rated. Uh, we took the worst streets that were arterial streets, and that's where the money went to. Uh, as just a... Uh, a little aside, I was driving down my neighborhood the other day, and one of the neighbors was out cutting his grass, and he waved very excitedly to me, and he doesn't usually do that. And uh, he came over to the window, and he said, I've only got two words for you. And I said, uh-oh. I thought, what, what are those two words? He said, quiet zone. He has a business in the quiet zone, and he wanted me to know that as a resident of Ward 3, he wanted the quiet zone during the day while he was doing his business down there. So it does have, I think, some widespread approval. Okay. Any other comments or questions here before we move forward? We have a motion. We don't have a motion. How about a motion? And we need a second. All right. Cast your votes on the approving the funding plan. And it passes by a vote of 7 to 1. Uh, we're still on items from council. James, you have anything else? Uh, I'm, I'm going to be at the uh, North Car Coronado Heights Neighborhood Association uh, tonight, and so despite that fact, I hope people show up. Um, and <laughs> that's uh, my that's my alma mater, my grade school. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Yeah. So uh, I just encourage everybody to come out. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to uh, answer all the questions they have. Which yeah. actually, hopefully, I can answer half of them because I won't be able to answer all of them. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, that's all I got. All right, Ed. I wanted to thank the city manager. I think I, um, we, we have dozens and dozens of employees that either lost their home or had substantial damage. And I understand they're getting a, a number of days paid off, uh, paid days off, uh, which I think is classy. I think it's the right thing to do, and I hope everybody. I just want to thank the city manager for that, Paul. I think that's the impact of the storm is deep, and and just for the public, I, I did issue a memo authorizing some administrative time. Uh, based upon people that can document their damage, and, it, and it's on a scale based upon the the amount of damage you've had, personally had. So, and it's it's amazing the number of, of employees that we had that were were impacted by the tornado. So, thanks for that comment, Larry. 
It's just like to pass along, if you would, to the chief, uh, uh, both chiefs of fire and, and police, how impressed I was on Friday. I had an opportunity to spend some time at the command center, uh, the professionalism of the individuals out there, uh, their empathy for the people, their desire to serve was just exemplary. And uh, I just couldn't be more proud to be a resident of Oklahoma City. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Pete? David? Uh, well, just to continue Councilman McAtee's comments again, uh, I can't uh, say how impressed uh, I was with everybody involved, uh, City Manager, Mr. Couch, uh, the Mayor, other members of the Council expressing their concern for the citizens uh, in South Oklahoma City, and, and as well as City of Moore. Uh, everybody's uh, concern was always directed towards the individuals and uh, the efforts by everybody certainly uh, proved that out. I also would like to thank the Rock Church, which hosted the command center. Uh, I know it's an inconvenience for the church and their members, and I do appreciate them opening up their uh, church for us, as well as St. Andrew's United Methodist Church, uh, serving as the host for the American Red Cross especially Monday night, uh, as it was also serving as the reunification center for the students and the parents and, and others who may have been missing. Uh, it was a difficult time. A lot of uh, anxiety was certainly present among everybody, but yet everybody maintained a calm nature. Uh, and uh, again, thank you uh, for everyone, uh, both their efforts as well as their uh, concern for the citizens of Oklahoma City and the city of Moore. Thank you. Hmm? Meg? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I think just a couple of things. A few things happened a, a week ago and we didn't have a chance to be together because of all of the tragedy and I just want to congratulate the Miller neighborhood for another really fabulous, successful house tour. It was a lovely day. Um, but a lot of things have gone on this weekend and uh, one of them in Ward to the Paseo Arts Festival was a huge success. Uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, I guess, there was food and music and some of the biggest crowds I've ever seen. It was really well done. And um, just one of the, you know, small groups of people that have come together to help on um, Sunday and on Monday, there was a, there were a pop-up restaurant um, in the beautiful space at the Myriad Gardens. And it ran Sunday uh, from brunch all the way through dinner. And then yesterday afternoon, from about 4 until 10 o'clock at night, I understand that the, they raised over $45,000 just on Saturday alone. That didn't take into account what happened on Sunday. And, or Monday, and I was there last night for dinner. It was an hour and a half wait at 6.30 to get in. And um, There were folks from all walks of life, baby strollers, people enjoying the park while they were waiting to go in. And it, it was a really unique thing. All the food was donated, all the chefs time was donated, um, they had raffles and various, you know, wine poles. It, it was just a huge success and just a very another kind of niche coming together of folks in the community to make a big difference for those affected. Thank you. John? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my prayers go out to the victims uh, and their families. Um, the second um, point, uh, next week I will be making an announcement as it relates to uh, zip code 73111. We all know that 73111 uh, is one of the most unhealthiest zip codes in our city. And as a city uh, elected official, I believe that I must lead by example. So on next week, I will be making an announcement as again as it relates to uh, 73111 uh, and the health challenges that residents face uh, within Ward 7. I will be leading. Uh, by uh, example, and we will make sure uh, that we will include uh, information about that announcement uh, later on uh, this week. Um, this weekend, Lupus uh, Foundation will have their uh, annual walk uh, at the zoo. Uh, so I believe the walk starts at uh, 8 o'clock a.m., and again, that will be at the zoo. Uh, there are two other events uh, that's happening in Ward 7. Uh, there uh, is a concert that will be uh, at the Bricktown Coca-Cola Event Center now, I believe the Chevy Center, uh, that will begin this Wednesday at 530. Uh, and that uh, proceeds from that particular concert will go towards victims 
and then also that same evening uh, at the Chesapeake Arena, uh, there will be a concert as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, Pat. I'd just like to pick up on what conversation we had earlier about uh, utilities not relocating their facilities in a timely manner. I would urge the city to do whatever we can to encourage utilities to be more responsive. Uh, I, I know at one time that the city work had a high priority with the utilities. I understand they've suffered a lot, Project 180, but I uh, don't think that our citizens ought to have to bear the inconvenience of those intersections, those roads being torn up a long time just because the utilities weren't responsible. And I would like to suggest that we review our method of awarding contracts and maybe put in some benefit, uh, rewards for prompt work by the contractor. We put out a what's called an A plus B contract uh, last month, I think, which is a bonus uh, penalty uh, contract, stronger. And so uh, that's the first one of those we, we, we put out, and we're going to monitor the progress on that. It has a strong penalty. Does it have a, 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 a carrot at the end of the stick? Yes. Both. Okay, good. That's the concept. Yeah. Okay. City manager reports. Uh, just, I'll be quick this morning, but just to highlight the uh, sales tax report. It, it was, it, if you read it, if you don't read the whole memo, it, it looks like it was down in a bad month for us, and it was slightly down. But we need to understand that there was an adjustment in there due, due to uh, for, for previous months, and so looking at that, it was only down a half a percent from last year, and last year was a major, one of our highest months ever. So it's really not a bad deal. We've met with with. Doug and, and Craig there and said, you know, because of that, that we need to change our projections for sales tax going into next year. And we talked about it for a long time. And we decided that we're pretty comfortable with what we've got in there. So we will not be changing our projections as we go forward. Uh, you know, you hate to have, you hate to have to have that conversation. But the fact of the matter is we, we did consider it very strongly and are comfortable going forward with the, with the numbers that we projected on it. So I want to share that with you. All right, citizens to be heard. Uh, no one has signed up to speak. Did anyone show up this morning to, to uh, be heard under uh, item 12, citizens to be heard? Okay. We're going to adjourn the council meeting and then reconvene as the uh, finance committee. So council meeting is adjourned, and now we'll convene as the finance committee. And I appreciate your, your, your uh, council working with us on this, with, with the fact that we canceled last week's finance committee. I had, we had three presentations planned for last week that we weren't able to do, so we thought we'd do one this time. And then we'd add the other three onto the Finance Committee next time as our plan to, to get caught back up. And so the guy that drove the uh, short straw this morning was Parks Director Wendell Wisenhut. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Um, due to the late hour, I promise you I will be brief. Um, I'd like to start by introducing Susan Kruta, who will help me today, one of the administrators in our department. And behind me, Wes Gray, our business manager, and Larry Ogle, the assistant director of Parks and Recreation. We recognize what an important task the creation of a budget that will guide us through the new year is. And I very much appreciate the help that I've received from staff in, in putting this together. <clears throat> the mission of the Parks and Recreation Department is to provide parks, recreational, and cultural services to Oklahoma City residents and visitors so they can enjoy an enhanced quality of life. A few years ago, we would have not used that word visitors, but now it needs a capital V because we have a park system that many people uh, are visiting from, from well outside of Oklahoma City, and we're very pleased about that. Quickly, I'd like to go through our departmental organization. The first line of business or division I'd like to mention is the administration division. The park planning and landscape architecture unit in that division provides design services both in in-house and to assist neighborhood associations. Our central business office handles the, the general business procedures of the department and issues hundreds and hundreds and thousands, as, that, as a matter of fact, of permits to citizens' reservations for them to use the parks. Uh, our, our single position marketing and public relations uh, unit does the best we can to get the word out, and we're doing better. We've got a long way to go. Uh, we have so much more to offer that we need to do a great job of getting the word out. And we continue to provide staff support for six commissions and trusts. We see that as a big advantage to us because those uh, groups give us great input from the citizens who talk to them so that we can see uh, where we should be going. 
Civic Center Music Hall Division includes the box office, performance venues of Civic Center and Rose State, and facility rentals. Facility rentals is a, is a big part of what this division does. Uh, we have more than 170 private rentals in addition to the performance rentals in those facilities. We sell more than 337,000 tickets we expect to in 14, FY14. So it's a division that has a great impact on the city of Oklahoma City. The Horticulture and Gardens Division is our beautification division, maintains the canal, portions of the canal, and handles the field horticulture, that is the horticulture throughout the community we, that we have a traveling crew to maintain. Also maintains Will Rogers Gardens. Uh, Will Rogers Gardens has certainly returned to, to its heyday. It's a beautiful facility. We've made great improvements as a result of bond issues over the last few years there. We're very proud to be associated with that. And then there's Martin Nature Park. Um, we're continuing to see uh, large crowds at Martin Nature Park. Matter of fact, we're seeing an increase in attendance there uh, on Sundays especially. Um, we expect to offer um, classes and tours to more than 7,800 participants at that 140-acre park. The Grounds Management Division um, is the division that, that does the work that we often don't see being done, and that's the maintenance of the athletic facilities in the parks and green space and medians, all the lake recreation areas, the Oklahoma River, and the forestry tree trimming throughout the community on public land. Recreation division, by, uh, by a long shot, is the division that has the, the greatest contact with citizens in our community in my department. Uh, they continue to operate aquatics facilities that are very successful. We'll continue to operate two family aquatic centers in the 17 spray grounds that were open over the past weekend. A very, very successful venture, both of those. We'll continue operating two swimming pools uh, and one indoor pool. Uh, last year we had more than 673,000 participations uh, at those facilities. Um, very successful. Um, much more successful than the facilities we had in the past. We also will continue to operate our fishing program, um, very successful program, large numbers of people uh, participate in that, primarily children. Uh, we have fishing classes, several around uh, all portions of the community. We have the only fish hatchery that is municipal fish hatchery in the, in the state where we stock between 700 and a million fish each year in the city ponds and lakes. Um, athletics, of course, and fitness is important, um, an offering that we have. We continue to operate two tennis facilities, one at Early Wine and Will Rogers, and 17 other tennis courts in the, in the park system. Uh, we are, by a large extent, the largest player in town in terms of athletic fields, more than 110 athletic fields to offer and gymnasiums spread throughout the community and our new adult fitness program is having a great impact on both citizens and city employees. Leading for results. The first issue I'd like to mention is that we continue to be aware that changing demographics and community growth patterns change what we need to be offering uh, in the community. We can't be static. Um, if without that, we will not be able to increase citizen satisfaction. We've done this in a, n a number of ways. Uh, we can't always have an additional park to build additional facilities, but we can closely watch when the, a particular type of facility is underutilized or lightly used and measure that against demands that we have for use uh, of, of facilities for other sports and park uses. And we've done that in many cases. Uh, one of the first um, or perhaps most uh, obvious cases is that uh, in Oklahoma City, uh, adult softball has waned over the years significantly, um, but we've had uh, increase in the demand for youth football uh, and other sports that have, uh, have caused us to, to convert fields from a sport that wasn't being used to one that was being used. We hope that increases the citizen satisfaction. Um, we know that citizens will continue to demand improved facilities and quality programs 
and we know that, that uh, the maintenance we offer to the parks and the buildings in the parks will have the greatest um, impact on that. Our satisfaction rate is quite high. Pardon me, shall I say, our dissatisfaction rate is quite low. It's often easier to measure dissatisfaction than satisfaction. We often speak up about things that we are not happy with. And our estimate for 13 is that 10% of the park visitors are dissatisfied with the maintenance of parks. This upcoming year, we hope to lower that to 8%. Operational efficiencies. We know that our traditional uh, service delivery model is very labor and energy inten intensive. Uh, our um, neighborhood park model uh, is very labor intensive and energy intensive. We've been giving great emphasis over the past few years to regional parks, such as you see depicted before you. Route 66 Park has a, a plethora of offerings that uh, a citizen can go to and spend the entire day, as can my maintenance crews. Uh, once they go there, they can spend the whole day maintaining that park rather than traveling from park to park. So we've seen increases in efficiency through the emphasis of regional parks. Um, we know that, that the addition of parks and facilities will require an increase or a reallocation in resources to maintain them. And we know that citizens will not be satisfied unless the parks are attractive and well maintained. Um, we believe that the addition of these parks uh, has had a great impact on the confidence of persons that they're going to enjoy parks before they go. And some of the current and upcoming projects we think will make them even more happy with the park system. Um, the ADA improvements that we've made over the past few, few years have opened up the, the park system to a, a group of folks who in the past had more difficulty using the park system. Um, we've also, um, ne we are nearing the completion, the city is nearing the completion of Zone G. We're looking forward to that, uh, making the, that tourist venue of the canal and the river to, to be linked. Where, of course, as you approved today, um, the project for Kitchens Lake in southeast Oklahoma City at 119th and Sooner, uh, that will be a new southeast park that will be primarily fishing uh, driven and it will be finished in early 14. Uh, those who are golfers will be pleased about the new development of the Lake, pardon me, Lincoln uh, Golf Course Clubhouse, so we're looking forward to that completion as well. So the more of these facilities we develop, the more we feel that we'll be servicing citizens in the way they want to be served. I'd like to mention just a few of, of our featured projects before we move on to the budget. One of those is the Ed Lockin Conservatory in Will Rogers Park. It's a very beautiful, um, very old, early 1900s Lord and Burnham English greenhouse kit that had um, deteriorated significantly. We now have bond issue monies to complete the repairs, and as you can see, the repairs are almost completed. It'll open again this summer for changing horticultural displays and rentals. It's really a beautiful facility and we're, we know that the public will once again be proud of it. Um, no news to all of you, the, the clubhouse really needed work at Lincoln. Uh, we're about to see that happen. It's gonna be the most beautiful clubhouse in Oklahoma City. We're really looking forward to that being completed. Um, it's going to have an emphasis of having uh, rentals uh, in addition to the, to the golf. So as a new revenue source. And I've already mentioned Canal Zone G. It's going to be a wonderful day when, when we can go from the canal onto the riverboat and make that boat, boating trip much longer. Well, and, and more importantly, from, from Brooktown, Brooktown down to the river district, the boathouse district down there will be, and that will be completed within the next month, six weeks, somewhere yes. along those lines. So. Lo really looking forward to that. Uh, we, we thrive on partnerships. We have more than 50 community organizations that we partner with. This is just some of them. They provide services that uh, would go unprovided if we didn't have these partnerships. So we, we always want to mention how much we appreciate the help we get from, from community groups. We also have more than 72, actually, landscape partners who uh, landscape private, pardon me, public lands, and also maintain the landscaping that they put in. So we're all always very pleased to develop more agreements with them to do just that. Now quickly on to the budget. 
The major budget changes uh, in this submission include Civic Center facility and staffing, which, include, which is funded, of course, and uh, includes the event um, support and labor and um, purchases that we need to be successful with the upcoming musical Wicked. Uh, as you all know, when that play comes to town, it's very popular. We sell out every night. It takes more money to spend on the center to make that a successful uh, venture. So we have the money to, to make that, once again, a successful venture. Uh, we've included additional funds in the Civic Center budget for uh, products for resale for that venture as well as others. We've included additional funds for the software needed to maintain our contractual services there uh, and new LED lamps uh, and valve replacements uh, in the Civic Center. Mundane but very important in making things work for a, for a performance. We've also included funding for new planting bed maintenance along uh, I-40 and Morgan, as well as the Skydance Bridge, which we'll be maintaining. <clears throat> the Meridian Landing boating uh, site, where one boards the boating for the river, and canals on G. So we've included funding for the maintenance of all those areas. We've also included the ability to begin doing some maintenance along I-40 downtown. Think of it as the right-of-way. Um, along I-40 downtown. Very important that it look good, so we're, we're funded to do work there. We've also funded the ability to do greater maintenance along the I-235 I medical district, which has needed uh, more attention for some time. Uh, the Myriad Gardens um, is now, will now be fully uh, transferred to the Myriad Gardens Foundation, no longer an operating part of the, of the Parks and Recreation Department. One moment, please. We have also restored a position at, the, at Martin Park Nature Center. We once had an assistant naturalist there. For a number of years, we've only had a single full-time employee, a naturalist. Uh, we very much need an assistant naturalist, another full-time employee, to help us with the, the high attendance that we have there. But remember, we have people hiking all over that park. It's 140 acres. We really need the ability to have leadership out there to manage that park. We've also restored. Stop there just for a second. That was really an example of, 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 of a cut that was made during the budget crisis a couple of years ago, yes, where that was given up, and you know we tried to get, get by without it, and we really, you know, we just cut too deep in that area. So now we're able to, to restore it when times got a little bit better. But yeah, that's just an example of one that we didn't really want to cut, but we needed to to make the, the budget a few years back. We've we've done our best to get by without it, but uh, there's, you know, we've used part-time funds essentially and we have high turnover amongst our part-time employees, uh, we need the investment of a full-time assistant naturalist there, and with this budget, we'll have that. We've also restored the community center supervisor, a full-time position for leadership at Melrose Center. Melrose Center is one of our most uh, important and we think critical centers. It's the only for center for many, many miles in West Oklahoma City. It's very near a grade school. We have great participation of children and we need the leadership there of a full-time position, and we funded that in this budget as well. So with that, I'll just mention to you that the uh, proposed budget for FY14, the operating portion of the budget is $26,260,864, with the entire proposed, opera, uh, that is proposed budget of $31,782,716, and a complement of 188 authorized positions. I will mention that this budget has gone before the Board of Park Commissioners, and they, they did approve it uh, unanimously. So what can we do with this uh, budget? We'll have a great community impact, we feel. We expect to issue more than 15,000 fishing permits. We expect to have more than 20,000 participations in our athletic programs, our in-house athletic programs. We expect more than 44,000 volunteer hours to benefit our operation, more than 50,000 visits to our senior centers, more than 280,000 visits, participations at our recreation centers, uh, visits to the Civic Center uh, facilities should uh, exceed 355,000, 
We expect about 471,000 aquatics participations, and we expect to continue maintaining almost 4,600 acres community-wide. So is this working? We think the best uh, indicator that it is working is that 75% of citizens have stated in surveys that they either participate in park programs or visit a park. That's a lot of us, a lot of us. Uh, we're very pleased about that because it's an increase over past years of 70%. We want to see that continue to increase, but we want people to be happy when they're there. With that, I would uh, end my presentation and say this is a good budget. I've been around long enough that I remember those years when I would be here telling you what I was cutting out of the budget and services that I'd no longer be able to provide. Um, we want those days to never return. Questions for Wendell? Yeah, Pat. Uh, comment, Wendell, you're doing an excellent job. <coughs> In every project I've been involved with, the Parks Department has been a good project. Thank you, sir. But sometimes I think we ought to follow the philosophy, don't just do something, sit there. Uh, we need some green space, where there's nothing to do except walk and, and appreciate nature. And I think sometimes we, we err on the side of trying to put a facility in there or something that people can use when they would probably equally, or maybe more so, appreciate just a place where they can walk through. Bluff Creek Park is, I think, a great example of, of that way it's been maintained. You know, it, it is, and I've had uh, quite a few requests related to Bluff Creek Park to uh, allow some sort of athletic field development or otherwise on that large meadow that you see when you first drive in. Uh, our master plan for that park, and master plans are very valuable uh, for us to, to judge how the park should be developed in the future. The master plan says that that's to be left an open meadow. Uh, open meadows like that can be used for all kinds of unplanned activities. Um, it can be a, a person with his frisbee and his dog. It could be, uh, you know, a, a pickup game of some kind. But that unplanned space is very important. We agree with you there. Yes, sir. We do agree with that. David? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, and I'd like to just continue on with Pat's comment. And Wendell, I appreciate your resistance to give in to the demands to, for example, increase the parking uh, at Early Wine. And, and I know South Park's act, uh, level of activity continues to increase. And I agree with Pat. We've got to protect just the green space, the, the open area and not give in to continued request for increasing parking. We'll find a way to get to that park, even if it means walking and further additional exercises, exercise to get there. But I do think it's important that we do protect the green space that we have in our parks and try to identify more when possible. We do need to be careful that we don't just continue to build more and more and more parking in a park because problems can ensue as a result of that. We love visitors to parks, and we're not trying to limit that, but there are times when too many cars um, can be problematic. There's a limit. Thank you. Pete. Ed? Uh, with the original MAPS-3 timeline, the north portion of the Central Park would come online in 2014. It looks <coughs> like that would be pushed back. But I, I would anticipate that a year from now, when you're standing here, We'll be talking about that coming online and adding, I don't, I don't know how many millions a year in operations and maintenance. Besides the recommendations that Hargraves is making, what, what are we doing to prepare, maybe in terms of looking at private sponsorships or benefactors or other uh, ways to deal with, with that new millions of dollars? Uh, well, of course, that's primarily the task of the MAPS department. However, we do attend meetings with, with the consultant, uh, when the consultant's in town, with the MAPS group. Uh, I think the first question that we've got to answer is, so how will it be operated? Will, be, will it be operated by the Parks and Recreation Department, or is there a foundation that would uh, see that as something they could be involved in? Uh, that's the biggest question, I think, that, that we need to answer first. And have but, you, but have our, you Go ahead. Hargraves has been tasked to come up with the operating costs and ways to offset those operating costs. And let me, I can share with you some, some, of, the, some of those thoughts. One would be some type of conservancy uh, similar to what's done at the Marriott Gardens. Right. Uh, secondly would be a potentially a, a, a business improvement district where, where the, uh, those that are adjacent to the park would, would, be, would benefit or would, would help offset some of those costs. 
there will certainly be uh, programming revenues off, off of activities at the park that will be done. There's some thought that maybe we can dedicate the parking revenue adjacent to the park and, and, and put that into it. And there'll be, I'm sure, some, some opportunity for general fund dollars to also be put in, in, into it to make it happen. But those are just five, five different funding sources that we can come up with real quick that we, 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 we can work with to, to come up with a model that will work for us on down have, the line. Have we, to, to your knowledge, have we seen any movement on a foundation or? Uh, <clears throat> Actually, uh, uh, Mayor and I had some conversations about that, and, and, and we're, we're trying to come up with a strategy on it. Wendell, we appreciate your work, as always. Thank you. Please pass that along to your staff. We're, they're very much appreciated. I must say, sir, we do enjoy it. It's, it's, a, it's very re redeeming work that we're involved in. Thank you. I'm glad you feel that way. All right. No departments want to follow Wendell because he always has the best, he always has the best pictures of the kids in session. So nobody ever wants to follow him. So Mayor, I would suggest we adjourn. All right, we're going to adjourn the finance committee. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>